rights to free speech and our democratic processes depend upon robust free speech. Speech with which we agree and speech with which we disagree. The marketplace of ideas. Since the beginning of journalism, there has been bias in the media. From the first journalist carving on stone tablets, media bias and, and bias of human beings has been a fact of life. But today we face an altogether different threat. The power of big tech is something that William Randolph Hearst at the height of yellow journalism could not have imagined. In particular, what makes the threat of political censorship so problematic is the lack of transparency, the invisibility, the ability for a handful of giant tech companies to decide if a particular speaker is disfavored, that he or she may speak and their words simply fade into the ether, that no one hears what they say and nobody knows that no one hears what they say. Not only does big tech have the power to silence voices with, with, with which they disagree, but big tech likewise has the, has the power to collate a person's feed so that they only receive the news that comports with their own political agenda. Polling shows roughly 70% of Americans receive their political news from social media. That power is enormous. And I will tell you in traveling the state of Texas and traveling the country, over and over again, I've heard from Americans concerned about a consistent pattern of political bias and censorship on the part of big tech. Big tech enjoys a special immunity from liability under what's called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Now, a great many people agree that the pattern, the anti-conservative bias and the pattern of censorship we're seeing from big tech is concerning. The question of remedy is a more complicated one. What to do about it is a thorny question. It's a thorny legal question. It's a thorny policy question. Nobody, or at least nobody in their right mind, wants to see a government speech police. No one wants to see the federal government regulating what is allowed to be said. But there are at least three potential remedies that can be considered either by Congress or the administration or both. The first I mentioned is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. That provides a special immunity from liability that big tech enjoys that nobody else gets. The predicate for that immunity from liability is that the social media platforms were understood to be neutral public fora. In other words, they were simply posting what others said. They weren't engaging in their own political advocacy. Now, I will note some commentators have misunderstood the argument I'm making in this, in that they've suggested that I'm arguing that Section 230 requires in its statutory text that big tech companies be neutral public fora. That's not my argument. My argument is that big tech made effectively a bargain with Congress and a bargain with the American people. We'll be neutral, we'll be fair, we won't be biased, and in exchange for that, will receive what is effectively a federal subsidy of immunity for liability. If big tech wants to be partisan political speakers, it has that right. But it has no entitlement to a special immunity from liability under Section 230 that the New York Times doesn't enjoy, that the Washington Post doesn't enjoy, that nobody else enjoys other than big tech. The second potential avenue for remedy is the antitrust laws. Applying the antitrust laws in this area is complicated. But by almost any measure, the giant tech companies today are larger and more powerful than Standard Oil was when it was broken up. They're larger and more powerful than AT&T was when it was broken up. And if we have tech companies 
using the powers of monopoly to censor political speech, I think that raises real antitrust issues. The third potential avenue of remedy is under principles of fraud. Most users of Facebook or Twitter or Google, when they use those services, they don't envision that they're participating in a biased forum. They believe that when they speak, the people who've chosen to follow them will hear what they say. And there are distressing pieces of evidence that suggests that's not the case. Now, I will note, much of the argument in this topic is anecdotal. It's based on one example or another example. There's a reason for that, because we have no data. There is no transparency. Nobody knows how many speakers Twitter is blocking, how many speakers Facebook is blocking. Nobody knows what the raw data is in terms of bias. So one of the first things that this hearing seeks to accomplish is simply move us towards transparency, to understand what the facts are. Argument by anecdote is less than satisfying, but it is all we are left with as long as big, big tech remains a black box that simply says, trust us. Senator Hirono. Thank you. I join the chairman in welcoming our witnesses this afternoon. There are many areas where the Senate should be conducting oversight of the tech industry. Basis allegations of anti-conservative bias is not one of them. We still need a full accounting of the ways that Russia used Facebook and other forms of social media to influence the 2016 election. YouTube is full of misleading and outright false information about vaccines that has put the public at risk. The alt-right continues to use Twitter to organize and spread hate. Each of the companies that will be testifying here this morning failed to contain the spread of the video of the mosque shootings in New Zealand, videos that can still be found on these platforms. These are just a few of the real and serious issues we could investigate about the tech industry. Yet here we are discussing claims of anti-conservative bias that have been disproven time and again. One of our witnesses, Professor Francesca Cipotti, studies partisanship on social media and finds that conservative perspectives abound on Facebook, Google, and Twitter. She describes claims of anti-conservative bias as nothing more than a mix of anecdotal evidence, which the chairman has uh, acknowledged, and a failure to understand the company's algorithms and content moderation practices. Professor Chipotle's conclusions are consistent with those of Media Watchdog, Media Matters, and others that anti-conservative bias simply does not exist. So why are we here? If anti-conservative bias by the tech industry has been proven false, why in the world are we holding a hearing on it in the United States Senate? The answer is simple, people, it's politics. For decades, Republicans have bashed the supposedly liberal mainstream media in an effort to work the refs and gain more favorable coverage. And the strategy has worked. Research shows that major news outlets have overcompensated for their perceived liberal bias by treating Democrats more harshly than Republicans. For example, the Harvard Kennedy School's Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy found that Hillary Clinton received a larger share of negative news coverage over the course of the 2016 election than Donald, Donald Trump did. Now that two-thirds of Americans get their news from social media, Republicans have a new boogeyman to target, big tech. And just like traditional media, te media, tech companies have responded to false claims of bias by trying to placate the right. In June 2016, Facebook's chief operating officer, Sheryl Sandberg, went to the conservative American Enterprise Institute to announce that Facebook would offer political bias training to its employees. Over the past two years, Facebook and Twitter have dispatched emissaries to meet with Republican leaders and conservative commentators behind closed doors. Last summer, 
Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey seemingly apologized in response to baseless claims that Twitter engaged in so-called shadow banning of conservatives, tweeting, we have a lot more work to do to earn people's trust on how we work. We simply cannot allow the Republican Party to harass tech companies into weakening content moderation, moderation policies that already, that already fail to remove hateful, dangerous, and misleading content. Anyone who frequents social media knows that the online world can be a pretty vile place. Unfortunately, few people know this better than another one of our witnesses, Robbie Parker. Robbie is the father of Emily Parker, one of the 20 children and six adults murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School in December of 2012. After suffering through this terrible tragedy, Robbie and his family have spent the past six plus years dealing with online harassment from conspiracy theorists who claim the shooting was a hoax. Think about that. Robbie had his daughter tragically taken from him. While he struggled to cope with that loss, he had to deal with people telling him that his daughter didn't die, that he was a crisis actor paid to stage a shooting as a way for the government to confiscate people's guns. To this day, if you Google Robbie's name, you are presented with links to conspiracy sites. And just yesterday, I Googled Robbie Parker, and this is what I got back. Two of the three videos claim the Sandy Hook was a hoax, and the very first web page returned is called, quote, if Sandy Hook was not a hoax, how do you explain the Robbie Parker video, end quote. This is over six years since the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, and these lies are still being featured by Google. I had hoped to discuss this and other concerns I have with Google during today's hearing. Unfortunately, the chairman rejected Google's proposed witness and wouldn't even let him attend at my invitation. So there is an empty seat over there at the witness table. This is important because Robbie is an example of the real world harm that comes with content posted on the internet. He is an example of why strong content moderation is necessary. Now, I understand that some conservatives have had content removed based on Facebook, Google's, and Twitter's content moderation policies. But let's be clear, it's not because they're conservative. After all, Google and Facebook are two of the biggest and most profitable companies on the planet, acknowledged by the chair too. They did not reach this level of success by turning away a portion of their potential customers. If conservatives have had their content removed, maybe they should look at the content, at the content that they're posting. Maybe they shouldn't post lies about Planned Parenthood selling baby body parts. Maybe they shouldn't inflame religious tensions by misrepresenting the tenets of one of the world's major religions. Or maybe they shouldn't use their platform to harass and spread lies about a dad who lost his little girl in the most tragic way possible. I hope that going forward, this subcommittee will focus on the real issues facing America, like hate speech, like voter suppression, like looking into the emoluments clause. That's what I'd like this committee to pursue, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hirono. And now to address the question of whether or not bias and censorship exists, uh, we have a member of this committee who indeed uh, has faced it firsthand, Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think it is fair to say I've had a couple of brushes with social media companies in the past couple of years. And I will also say it is indeed a pleasure and an honor to live in a country that values free speech. We see this as a cherished constitutional right. In authoritarian countries like Russia or China, there is no such thing as free speech. And if you were to voice any form of dissent or criticism, then surprise, a Communist Party official shows up on your doorstep and they take you to prison. Fortunately, we live in America. 
I will tell you that I do think it's time for tech companies like Google and Facebook to start embracing the spirit of the First Amendment, not just for their own employees, but for all the Americans who use their platforms. What value is there in platforms that are more concerned with inserting their bias than providing a neutral place for people to discuss their ideas? Companies like Facebook and Google, which have transformed society in revolutionary ways, need to recognize that with that power comes great responsibility. Facebook is a corporation, not a state actor. Yet Facebook runs a forum for debate like the town public square, except there is no mayor or sheriff that would be allowed to police conversation the way that Facebook censors conversation online. Last June, I published an op-ed urging Silicon Valley companies to respect a diversity of opinions and to address allegations of conservative bias on their platforms. If they truly were impartial actors encountering a series of unfortunate events, Lay their case out for the American public. Lay out your case. My suggestions really didn't go over very well in the Silicon Valley. Little has changed since then. Earlier this month, Google bent the knee to employ demands to shut down its external AI ethics board because, heaven forbid, a woman serving on the committee was the president of a respected conservative think tank. For these employees in Silicon Valley, conservative credentials are absolutely a scarlet letter. Unfortunately, Facebook is no different. By one count, Facebook had nearly two dozen scandals over privacy violations in 2018 alone. At some point, Facebook will have to atone for these sins. Clearly, GDPR isn't causing the company much pain. If anything, it appears to have solidified their dominance in the marketplace while increasing barriers to entry for potential competitors. I think we should be clear that at least here in the United States Senate, Mark Zuckerberg's pivot to privacy isn't fooling anybody. This sudden support for European-style privacy protections is disingenuous. By allowing the Europeans to force their hand when it comes to addressing content, including political speech, Facebook can cloak itself in altruistic cloth while conveniently evading any constitutional arguments back at home. In order to arrive at consensus on privacy, data security, and net neutrality issues, we're maintaining a bipartisan posture, both on the Commerce and Judiciary Committees. This week, Senator Klobuchar and I sent a letter to the FTC urging stronger action for bad actors in the tech sector. Americans are rightly concerned about who owns their virtual you. They want to be certain that their privacy is protected both in the physical and the virtual space. The FTC has a responsibility to hold tech companies accountable for securing their platforms. Big tech is accustomed to living in a bubble with the same comfortable and progressive ideas. But let me tell you right now, that bubble is bursting. When I voiced my concerns about infringements on our freedom of speech, a senior Google search engineer called me a terrorist. I was a congressman when I voiced my concerns in 2018, and I sit before you now as a senator and a member of this panel. No matter what, I will continue to protect the right of Americans to engage in free speech even speech I disagree with. I wish big tech would show the same respect. Whether Californians like it or not, they are going to need to work with us and negotiate with us to see how we can bring meaningful privacy reforms to the people of the United States of America. I yell back.
Thank you, Senator Blackburn. We'll now introduce each of the two witnesses on our first panel. Uh, the first witness is Carl, Carlos Monje Jr., who is Twitter's Director of Policy and Philanthropy for the United States and Canada. Before joining Twitter, Mr. Manji spent over a decade in public service, including multiple senior level positions in the Obama administration. From 2014 through 2016, he served as the, in the U.S. Department of Transportation, rising to acting undersecretary and assistant secretary for transportation policy, where he oversaw the implementation of surface trans transportation programs. Prior to joining the Department of Transportation, Mr. Manji served for three years in the White House Domestic Policy Council, where he oversaw all aspects of policy, message, and event development across a wide spectrum of domestic policy issues. Mr. Manji is from New Orleans, a first-generation American, and a graduate of Harvard College. The second witness is Neil Potts. Neil Potts is the public policy director at Facebook, where he currently leads the content policy and strategic response teams. He oversees the development and implementation of Facebook's community standards, the rules for what types of content are allowed on the platform. Mr. Potts previously spent a decade in Washington, D.C. as a public policy and legislative affairs attorney, including five years at the Truman National Security Project. He is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, having served five years as an intelligence officer after graduating with a degree in mathematics from the United States Naval Academy and he's a graduate at the University of Virginia School of Law. Welcome to you both. I would ask that you stand, raise your white right hand, and be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Mr. Manji, you may go first. Thank you, sir. Chairman Cruz, Ranking Member Rono. Members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today. Twitter is an American company, and Twitter's purpose is to serve the public conversation. We welcome perspectives and insights from diverse sources and embrace being a platform where the open and free exchange of ideas can occur. We put the people who use our service first in every step we take. We have rules in place that are designed to ensure the safety and security of the people who come to our service. Safety and free expression go hand in hand, both online and in the real world. If people don't feel safe to speak, they very often won't. These two guideposts, free expression for all perspectives and rules of the road to promote safety, are not only in our users' interest, but also paramount to sustaining our business. Let me be clear about an important and foundational fact. Twitter does not use political viewpoints, perspectives, or party affiliation to make any decisions, whether related to automatically ranking content or how we enforce our rules. Every day, elected representatives use Twitter to communicate with their constituents, with their peers, and international counterparts. In the United States, every single senator, governor, and House member has a Twitter account. Millions of people around the globe take to Twitter to engage in conversations on a wide range of issues. The notion that we would silence any political perspective is antithetical to our commitment to free expression. There has never been a time in history when individuals have had more tools to reach a broad audience. And Twitter continues to be one of the most popular platforms for conservative voices. In preparation for this hearing and to better inform the members of the subcommittee, our data scientists analyzed tweets sent by all members of the House and Senate for a five-week period from February to March of this year. After controlling for factors like number of followers, we observed that there is no statistically significant difference between the number of times a tweet by a Democrat is viewed versus a tweet by a Republican. Their performance is the same because the Twitter platform does not take sides. Let me t address a few high-profile issues that have led some to question our impartiality. In July of last year, we acknowledged that some accounts, including those of Republicans and Democrats, were not being auto-suggested when people were searching for a specific name. This means that you had to hit enter before seeing them in the search results. This issue impacted 600,000 accounts across the globe, the vast majority of which were not political. And however, 10 accounts of Republican members of Congress were affected. The auto-suggest issue happened 
because Twitter had tweaked a behavioral-based algorithm designed to reduce abuse. Specifically, we were downranking content if a significant number of an account's followers had histories of breaking our rules. Once we identified this issue, we promptly resolved it within 24 hours. And it is important to note that because Twitter is so transparent, follower counts of those members of Congress spiked following the publicity on the issue. I would like to discuss another recent uh, issue, the account at Unplanned Movie. This account was caught in our automated systems used to, de to detect ban evasion. Ban evasion technology is an important tool to reduce the number of repeat offenders on our platform. Specifically, the person who created the movie's account was previously suspended for breaking our rules. We reinstated at Unplanned Movie as soon as it was brought to our attention that the account was not being used for similar violative activity. And the hashtag Unplanned Movie became a trending topic on Twitter. Many other accusations of bias stem from issues about how our platform organizes information and often very serious violations of our terms of service, which are not always visible to the public. I explain these in greater detail in my written testimony. Every day, we see hundreds of millions of tweets and thousands of violations of our policies. We try to get each one of those right, but we do make mistakes on all sides of, ev of the political spectrum and all around the world. We will consistently work to get better and to be more transparent about our efforts. Senator Blackburn, we've apologized to your Senate office and to the campaign, but on behalf of Twitter, I apologize again. We made the wrong call. We developed policies governing advertisements that run on Twitter that try to balance allowing our advertisers to promote messages with protecting individuals who did not ask to see that ad. I'm sorry. Twitter wouldn't be Twitter if everyone had the same viewpoint. We strive to balance safety and freedom of expression every day. We believe strongly in being impartial, and we endeavor to enforce our rules dispassionately. We work extremely hard to make sure our algorithms are fair and aim to be transparent and fix issues when we make mistakes in order to maintain the trust of our users, advertisers, and the general public. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Potts. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Cruz, Ranking Member Hirono, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Neil Potts, and I'm a director at Facebook with oversight of our community standards. Those are the rules which allow which types of co content we have on the platform. I'm a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and the University of Virginia, of Virginia School of Law. Prior to joining Facebook, I served as a ground intelligence officer in the United States Marine Corps where I was deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. Facebook's mission is to give people the power to build community and to bring the world closer together. More than two billion people come to our platform every month to connect with family, to connect with friends, to find out what's going on in their world, to build their businesses, to volunteer or donate to organizations they care about, and to help those in need. Our users share billions of pictures, stories, and videos about their lives and their beliefs every single day. It's this diversity of viewpoints, expression, and experiences that highlights much of what is good about Facebook, but can also mean that it's tough to make decisions about what should be and should not be allowed on the platform. I would like to make one point clear. Facebook does not favor one political viewpoint over another and we do not suppress conservative speech. We are committed to encouraging dialogue and the free flow of ideas by designing our products to give people a voice, by implementing standards and to ensure fair and transparent processes for removing content that does not belong on Facebook. We created our community standards to standardize our content removal decisions so they can be applied consistently, fairly, neutrally to a community that transcends regions, cultures, religions, and languages. And we take that neutrality seriously. Our artificial intelligence algorithms have been designed and our human content reviewers have been trained to ensure that content is reviewed in a neutral, unbiased way. And we're really focused on what's needed to keep our users safe. Our community standards do not prohibit users from discussing controversial topics or supporting a debated point of view, nor do they favor opinions on one end of the political spectrum or another. 
Given the vast amount of content we have on our platform, our reviewers have to respond to millions of reports each week from people all over the world. And we don't, we don't always get it right. We know that there have been a number of high profile content removal incidents, and we're taking several steps to respond to those concerns raised by the subcommittee and others. First, we publish a community standards enforcement report twice a year, and that, that report describes the amount and types of content we have taken action against. We publish com comprehensive guidelines to provide more clarity around content moderation decisions. Second, we've solicited external feedback on our content moderation policies and sources across the political spectrum. For example, former Senator Kyle, he is leading a team gathering insights from members of Congress, a number of conservative groups, assessing whether there are any ways which the company is unintentionally biased against conservative points of view. Another example is Laura Murphy. She's a national civil liberties and civil rights leader who is guiding an independent civil rights audit of our platform. Third, we've created an appeals process for content that's been removed from our platform as hate speech. We're working to extend that process further by creating an independent oversight board of experts for, on free speech and safety to render binding and transparent decisions on these appeals. Fourth, we've partnered with over 100 groups across the political spectrum. We're continuing to expand that list of outside partner organizations to ensure we receive feedback on our content policies from a diverse set of viewpoints. And finally, we're continuing our work to refine and enhance the quality of our machine learning. The machine learning, which is the, our first line of defense, the content assessment on our platform. We hope that these improvements and safeguards will help ensure that Facebook remains a platform that enables the broadest spectrum of free expression possible, while still keeping our space welcoming and safe for the entire community. There's a lot more to do, but we're proud of the significant progress we've made over the last few years. Still, we know that people have questions, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you to both of the witnesses, and I'll note also for the record that originally there was planned to be a third witness from Google, uh, as the ranking member observed. However, Google declined to provide a witness of comparable seniority and responsibility in the company as the other two witnesses here. And so accordingly, this committee will be conducting a se separate and subsequent hearing focused directly on Google and the issues of Google's uh, censorship of speech. Gentlemen, let me, let me start with a question that I have asked both of your companies more than once, uh, which is a, a simple and straightforward question that I'd like to get a simple and straightforward answer to, which is, and let's start with you, Mr. Manje, does Twitter consider itself a neutral public forum? Twitter strives every day to be an impartial platform uh, where all voices uh, can come and speak. Mr. Manji, you answered this recently in the House and gave an answer that was a long paragraph and, and, and it didn't answer it. So, so I'm going to try. I don't actually expect to get an answer because I've asked you this before. But are you able to answer yes or no whether you consider yourself a neutral public forum? I didn't testify in the House, sir. Um, I, uh, I'll answer the same way. Okay, which please, is, please do that. Uh, which is that uh, Twitter is an open internet platform uh, where people from all stripes and political affiliations all around the globe come and speak. Okay, let me help you recently. Uh, let, let, let me help you on this. Uh, Doris. So recently the CEO of, of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, said, quote, I don't believe that we can afford to take a neutral stance anymore. I don't believe that we should optimize for neutrality. Does rep this represent the policy of Twitter? I have not seen that quote, sir. Do, uh, do you agree with it? That is not how he is building uh, the platform and how uh, everybody who comes to Twitter every day. Uh, I think it's important to note, sir, that three quarters uh, of our users are, are overseas, uh, and that we are a global company uh, that is staffed globally. All right, Mr. Potts, uh, same question for Facebook. Does, does Facebook consider itself a neutral public forum? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think first and foremost, we consider ourselves a technology company. Uh, we are a platform for a diversity of viewpoints, and we moderate those viewpoints under our community stand standards. Okay, I'm gonna try one more time to get a yes or no, but, but, but your company is likewise uh, consistently refuse to answer this, so I probably can't. Uh, do, do you consider yourself a neutral public? You have a choice. You, you can be yes or no. I'd, I'd fine either way. No, again, again, Chairman, I, we are a technology company. We have a mission to build a community, to bring the world closer together. We try to do that through our community standards. 
uh, and to ensure that diverse viewpoints are allowed on the platform. All right, let's, let's try a second area of inquiry. Um, the ranking member suggested that there is no censorship. Uh, and, and indeed, she said there are just a handful of anecdotes. You know, I will note, among other things, that Senator Blackburn, her announcement video announcing for the United States Senate was pulled down, as Mr. Manji rightly uh, apologized for. But yet these anecdotes all seem to be consistently on one side of the spectrum. Uh, so, so let me a ask a question, uh, Mr. Manji. In the year 2018, how many tweets from elected officials did Facebook pull down? I I'm sorry, Twitter pulled down. Uh, I'd have to get back to you on those specific uh, cases. If I, if I could uh, follow up, though, sir, um, every day we see 500 million tweets, uh, and we have to action thousands of accounts, uh, and that those happen literally all across the political spectrum and literally all over the globe. One in a million happens 500 times a day on Twitter. And if you are looking uh, for data points to support any narrative, you can find it. Are you aware of even a single Democratic politician who has had a tweet pulled down? I'm not. I, I am. Uh, could you share that, please? Yes, sir. Uh, and I will note uh, that uh, we are as committed to transparency as, as, as you have described and have taken a number of steps to improve transparency. We also have to uh, protect the privacy and security of our users, uh, people who didn't ask to be part of the, the spotlight. But let me, let me follow up on your question, sir. Although, to be fair, if someone's tweeting, they are asking the world to see what they're saying. I mean, that's the, the essence of a social media post as you're posting it. That's true, but our actions on, on those accounts are also uh, matters of, that are extremely sensitive. And, and but if I could follow up on your, on your specific question, uh, I, I'm not going to mention specific names uh, in a public forum, uh, but very recent examples. Uh, we recently changed our impersonation policy. Uh, that allows, if I, if I could, sir, you, you asked the question. Uh, our impersonation policy that allows third, third parties to report impersonation, and we had uh, two current U.S. sitting senators, a sitting governor, and a sitting state attorney general, all Democrats, who were uh, impacted by that. Second uh, case, uh, advertising transparency. We, we uh, uh, honored the, uh, the, the ideas that were part of the Honest Ads Act and agree with the idea that uh, political advertising should be more transparent. Uh, in the process of setting that up. A number of accounts got caught up in that that include three current Democratic candidates for president and a major national pro-choice group. Uh, somebody mentioned the general data protection regulations out of Europe. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, so the, 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 time the, 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 main, the main purpose being, sir, is that uh, these folks uh, didn't uh, put out a press release about it. They, they called us. Uh, we, we do trainings to all members of Congress. Well, Mr. Bongi, I appreciate they, they, they you're they saying us. you will answer the questions when we provide them in writing. I'd like to get specific answers to the question. Let me, let me pose it to Mr. Potts, and I'll, I'll point Mr. Potts. In 2018, how many posts from elected officials did Facebook pull down? Uh, Chairman, I, I don't have that figure, but I'm happy to follow up with you at a later time. Well, I would ask you to, and I would note that when Mr. Zuckerberg testified before this full committee, I submitted that question and a number of other questions in writing to Facebook, and, and you at the time refused to answer it and gave, the company instead gave legal boilerplate and refused to answer the question. And nobody here knows. We know that Senator Blackburn's post was, was pulled down. Uh, l l l let me ask a, a comparable question, because it's not just political, it's also ideological. There have been multiple instances of, in particular, pro-life groups being disfavored. For example, uh, here is a tweet uh, that says, abortion is profoundly anti-women, and it's a quote from Mother Teresa. And this tweet was blocked. Now, now it is fairly remarkable that Mother Teresa is now deemed hate speech. Um, do, do either of you agree with the proposition that Mother Teresa is, is, is issuing hate speech? I, is this hate speech? If I could uh, take a step back from that, uh, I believe that uh, that account is from uh, the Susan B. Anthony list. Correct. And uh, Susan B. Anthony is, a, is currently an advertiser in good standing on our platform. Last tweet, last but, promoted Mr. tweet. you, you're very good at not answering questions. It just, uh, is this hate speech? I, uh, every, every tweet uh, has context behind it, and every decision that's made uh, has, the has context. Tweet. There's no more context. I, 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 you, there, um, I can tell you that we have actioned uh, accounts on both sides of this debate, uh, including uh, tweets by pro-choice by pro groups uh, who have said uh, that everybody who's pro, 
uh, life is misogynistic. Uh, there are uh, many pro-life groups that advertise on our platforms currently in good standing, and advertisers across the board, whether they're selling soap or uh, NFL, uh, sometimes have uh, advertisements that are caught in our, in our systems. Well, and the reason why... Well, and, and, and that is an area we'll be following up as well. So I appreciate your saying there are groups on the pro-choice side that you have blocked, and, and, and this committee is going to attempt to understand and quantify if there is a disparate treatment or not. If there's not a disparate treatment, that'll benefit Twitter to show that you're being even-handed. Um, the anecdotes we're aware of are consistently on one side of the aisle. Mr. Potts, do, do you consider this hate speech? Does it, Facebook consider this hate speech? Again, Chairman, I don't believe this was on our, our site, but uh, looking at that quote right now, um, the lights are a little bright, so my eyes, eyes are trying to zero in, or, or focus, I should say. Uh, that would not be in violation of our, our policies. And same question to, that Mr. Manji was asked is, are you, has Facebook, to your knowledge, ever blocked a post from Planned Parenthood? I, I believe that is correct. Uh, I believe we have, uh, Senator. Okay, I, we would be very interested in learning about that. When I asked Facebook that in writing after, the, after Mr. Zuckerberg's hearing, you again refused to answer that question as well. And, and so the basic data, if you are not engaged in censorship, releasing the data, how many people you're blocking, how many people you're downgrading, and what side of the political aisle or ideological aisle they're on, would go a long way to either clearing it up uh, or to demonstrating there's a persist persistent pattern of bias. Senator Rona. Uh, Senator, you, you may take the time you no, like. but I see there are all these people, I, so, you know, I don't want to take up their time. No, let's try to stick to five minutes. I, I'll tell you what, when you chair the committee, you can decide on, on the time. I hope that day comes soon. I, <laughs> we'll do our best to be really amicable around here. So, Mr. Potts, how many postings are um, on Facebook every day? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. There are over a billion postings on Facebook every day. That includes images, uh, text posts, uh, videos, and other types of content. One billion. And Twitter, um, Mr. Manji? It's Monhe. Thank you so much. Um, you said 500 million tweets yes, yes, every single day. And I think both of you said you're not perfect in your efforts to try and get rid of some of the, the what, dangerous, um, violent, hateful content. I think, both, did both of you say that? Yes, ma'am. And neither one of you is perfect, your companies. No, ma'am. Okay. So with 1 billion postings every single day, 500 million every single day, would it be accurate for me to say that I could find all kinds of, in fact, uh, as to uh, one of our other witnesses, I found, you know, just yesterday, all kinds of um, what I would say totally false allegations about that witness. So I probably could find all kinds of things that are on Facebook right now that, in my view, should be taken down. But I don't expect you all to be perfect. So it's in that context. Let's just make it really plain and clear. Do your platforms discriminate against conservative users? Do your algorithms have something that says, oh, these are the kinds of words that conservatives use, so we're just going to get rid of those postings or tweets? Uh, ranking member, our algorithms, our policies, our enforcement, uh, we do not can suppress any type of views, whether conservative or liberal. So you don't have any algorithm that says, here are the kind of words and, uh, and the areas that they go to and we're just going to get rid of them. You don't have anything like that. No, Senator. What about you? No, ma'am. Uh, party affiliation, political ideology is never an input. In so do, your, do either of your platforms discriminate against conservative content? Senator, we... We review our content under our community standards. If it violates our community standards, we apply those community standards evenly, uh, despite political ideology. So your community standards, by the way, is, is a little bit different than when you, when you said that um, you try to ID and remove violent, hateful, or da dangerous content. But the, the community standards uh, are a little bit broader or different than uh, those three uh, They are. I'm sorry, thank, thank you, uh, Senator. They are a bit more broad. They do include those, but they cover over 22 sections. Uh, they are, we are transparent with our community standards. The same guidelines that our reviewers use to moderate content, uh, those are available at facebook.com backslash community standards. 
uh, for the public to review so that the public also knows how to regulate their behavior on the platform. Does Twitter have something that's akin to Facebook's community standards? Yes, ma'am. We call them uh, our terms of service, and they're available at help.twitter.com. Terms of service. Terms of service. Okay. But you also try to ID and remove violent, hateful, or dangerous content? Uh, that's right. Okay. Yes, we have, we have a range of, uh, of rules. Does a user's political party affiliation play in application of a company's co content moderation policies? In fact, are your users supposed to identify them, their political affiliations before they use your platforms? Uh, no, ma'am. How are you even supposed to know what their political affiliations are? Do you? you certainly don't ask for them, right? So, okay. Now, there are some things that, that really, um, you know, I. I you are huge entities. I agree with the chairman on that. So after the tra tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012, the families didn't even have time to buy their bury, sorry, their children before conspiracy theories began to spread around the internet claiming that the shooting was all a hoax. I understand that many of the families reached out to each of your companies to remove these lies, but that most of their requests went unanswered. The content was only removed if it included a photo or video protected by copyright. Why did your companies allow these lies on your platforms even after they had been identified by the families? You can start, Mr. Potts. Thank you, Senator. We now have strong policies to prevent that type of behavior. Uh, and I, my heart goes out to uh, uh, the members here who have a connection to Sandy Hook and uh, other violent tragedies. If someone accuses a victim of a violent tragedy as, as being a crisis actor or that it never happened, we do remove that content as of today. You saw my board right there and it's still on there. I don't know if that's Facebook. I, I, I don't I, want to accuse the wrong company. I believe that is uh, all Google. Um, okay. Who's not here today? Okay, I wish they were here. So why you say that you now have policies. When did you adopt those policies? I will have to go back to check to confirm, but it was uh, about a year, maybe a little over a year ago. So it took you quite a while uh, after the tragedy 2012. I'd like to have Mr. Manje answer also before we move on. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, it is a terrible tragedy. I just uh, met Mr. Parker, and uh, our hearts break for, for his families and those that lost loved ones. Uh, we have also updated our uh, internal abusive uh, behavior policy to make clear that targeting other people with content that denies uh, the violent events happens is, our, is against our rules. Well, when did you update your uh, It was policy? last year. So it took both of you quite a long time to get to that. I would um, ask that, uh, that, well, now that you have these policies, then I guess I, I, I'm hopeful that these kinds of uh, lies against individuals do not get on your platforms. Thank you. Would Senator Hirono like any additional time? Thank you. Actually, yes. Okay. Um, Google is not here, and so I mentioned in my opening statement that I am disappointed that we don't have a witness from Google. And Google was ready and willing to send its acting director of political and stakeholder outreach, Max Pappas, to testify. You rejected Google's offer. And when my staff asked to invite Mr. Pappas as a minority witness, they were told by your staff that they could not do so because you had decided that no Google witness would be permitted to testify at the hearing. And in fact, Mr. Pappas is at the same level of responsibility as our two other witnesses right now. So I would like to enter into the record. I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to uh, enter into the record the testimony of Mr. Pappas. <coughs> without, without objection. Thank you. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to both, both of you for being here. Uh, this is an important issue, and uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, any time we're talking about speech, when someone brings up hate speech, there is a difference, of course, between what could lawfully be prohibited if we were talking about a government prohibition on speech uh, on the one hand and speech that uh, someone hates on the other hand. Um, I, I'd like to start with you, Mr. Potts. Can you tell me, uh, Facebook has a different standard for content generated by a user uh, who is not a paid advertiser versus paid advertisements, is that right? That's correct, Senator. Our uh, content policies apply to all user 
generated content. That's the community standards. Uh, that is the baseline. For advertisers, there are more stringent standards that sit on top of, okay. that, of those policies. And, and the reason for that is uh, you're being paid for that content and you feel a responsibility to moderate that content to a greater degree. Is that That's roughly correct. accurate? Okay. Are you, um, are you familiar with an instance a few months ago in which uh, Susan B. Anthony List, uh, a topic that came up in a slightly different context a few minutes ago, ran a couple of ads dealing with two prematurely born babies who survived, Charlotte Ryan and Micah Pickering. Uh, yes, Senator, I'm definitely familiar with the Micah Pickering example, uh, maybe a little less so with the Charlotte Ryan. Okay, so let's go with the Micah Pickering example. I met Micah Pickering, uh, uh, he's a healthy, happy little boy now. His images were featured in an advertisement purchased by the Susan B. Anthony List in order to promote life, in order to promote the idea that uh, children, even children born very prematurely um, uh, in the range of 20 to 22 gestational weeks can still survive and go on to live as ha happy, healthy human beings. And as I recall, that advertisement was taken bent down by Facebook, is that right? I believe that's correct, and I believe that we reinstated that advertisement uh, within 24 hours. Okay. At the time, what was Facebook's explanation for why it was taken down? Uh, I think it violated one of our advertising policies. Um, Which policy would that have been? I believe it was around, we have a policy around uh, somewhat graphic uh, content, and someone viewed that to be uh, graphic. I think the exact name is uh, the sensationalism uh, policy. Center. Okay. Graphic content, perhaps because it involved a medical procedure or perhaps because it depicted an infant uh, in, in a uh, position in which the infant had tubes it, going into it or something like it, that. It is a medical procedure. Okay. A medical procedure going on, that's depicted and that's regarded as graphic. Does your policy work even-handedly such that um, regardless of whether we're talking about pro-life versus pro-choice, what if the same image were depicted in a slightly different context, not advertising perhaps a, a pro-choice cause, but just another cause unrelated to pro-life? For example, what if that same image of Micah Pickering or series of Im images had been used in the context of an advertisement designed to focus on uh, the dangers uh, associated with drug abuse uh, uh, by a mother uh, carrying a child? Thank you, Senator. If it was the same picture, I'm assuming that the uh, same policy would have been applied the, hopefully the same way. We would like consistency there. As you know, that if there are different pictures, uh, that would perhaps uh, force either the, the uh, excuse me, the automation and or the reviewer to make it come to a different decision. Uh, so if a child is viewed um, that is 20 weeks maybe versus 24 weeks, I, I know that's uh, very narrow. It, for the reviewer, it may be different, but if the well, policy, surely the yeah, reviewer is not going to be able to differentiate between right. 22 and 24 weeks. Surely that's not going to make no the, the I, distinction. I, I don't want to. I don't want to um, try to get too nuanced there. But I, depending on if the uh, the view was that this was too graphic, and I think because of the the image which I which I recall, uh, that decision was made. Although it was made incorrectly to disallow the the, uh, the ad. But in, in fact, Mr. Potts, this is not hypothetical, is it? I mean, this has happened. Uh, we, we did, in fact, see the Susan B. Anthony List advertisement taken down while we had corresponding uh, images uh, used in advertisements that have not been taken down. Isn't that right? We have, but again, I don't think we've had the same image uh, used. Okay, you, okay. That's perhaps not the same image, right. but a, 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 an image of an infant in a comparably vulnerable position. And I think it all, in center, I think it all turns on the word comparably. I think they, they were similar images, but not the same image. So it makes the comparison a, little, a bit more difficult. But if they were the same image, I would expect them to have both been taken down by that same reviewer with a misapplication of our policies. And what explanation can you provide for me as to why one might have been taken down and the other not? Uh, regardless of whether you say they should have been consistent with Facebook's policy, what might account for why they might um, receive differential treatment? Uh, sometime, uh, Senator, I, I would like to say that, um, as we mentioned, we review billions of posts and other pieces of content. Sometimes we make mistakes. In this case of this reviewer uh, that reviewed that piece of content with Micah, he removed it incorrectly, or he or she removed it incorrectly. Uh, if that's the case, I would expect that reviewer to make the same uh, mistake, no, regardless of who shared that image, 
Now, if we take a different image run by the SBA, run by anyone, and place it there, and, he would, and if that person were to allow it, I assume that they would allow it across the board. That's why I don't know if I'm doing a great job of explaining that, but I'm... No, I, I, I think I understand yeah. uh, what you're suggesting, and I, and I, I understand and appreciate the point. Um, could it not also have to do with other factors, including possibly who is more likely to complain about the Susan B. Anthony image? Who is more likely to work at Facebook? Could that have something to do with it? I, I don't believe so, uh, Senator. I think uh, to a question of whether someone would try to influence a decision with their bias, uh, that's something that we really try to uh, exclude, to bring out of the process, to check any type of bias uh, at the door. We have a very strong managing bias curriculum uh, within the company. It's a rigorous program. Uh, I've never been in a position where I've written a policy or made an, an enforcement decision or sat with a product team building an engineering product where someone asked anyone's political affiliation or uh, whether they were pro-life or pro-choice. Um, again, this one seems like a mistake that I would expect it to have been made no matter who posted it. Okay. The, the chair has politely and, and gently reminded me that I'm over my time limit. I'm going to want to get back to this later um, and uh, got to go cast a vote. I do think it's worth mentioning here that it is something I consider a mathematical impossibility that there isn't uh, a subjective component to this that involves who is reviewing it. You can't entirely mechanize this. You can't uh, program it into an AI uh, uh, a feature to, to monitor this. There, it seems to me mathematically impossible to suggest that there isn't some subjective uh, judgment calling going on and, and that some of that might not be impacted by who works there. Now, Facebook is a private company. I differ from some of my colleagues in the approach I take to this. I don't view you as a public utility. I don't view you as being owned by the government. Um, but some of my colleagues see it differently. And so it's why it's important for us to flag this. As long as some of my colleagues see it that way, I think this is something that your company ought to focus on and ought to try to work to resolve. We'll get back to that later. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And before I get to my questions, and we do have a vote on the board, uh, Mr. Manji, you mentioned the GDPR. Uh, let me just say privacy as we know it, as the world knows it today, primarily is something the U.S. has led the way in creating privacy law. And then when you see this European style, uh, privacy that is GDPR, you know that uh, Europe doesn't have the most innovative and dynamic uh, economy and that the major players in this market are going to be U.S. companies and needing to have a privacy standard, one set of rules for the entire ecosystem is the reason I've reintroduced the Browser Act today so that we can do that. Let me... Um, just touching on content for a second, and um, we all, I think, have hoped that you would have a diversity of opinion in your platforms and that it would be a town square. And I know that Facebook has a 27-page memo on censorship. And um, we would hope that while you are rooting out violence and terrorist propaganda um, and keeping that off your pages, um, that you also are having your reviewers and your community that sets that st those standards and those that live and work there in um, California aware that uh, free speech requires that they um, be respectful of speech with which they do not agree. And we would hope that you all would go back to California uh, focused on exercising that with that respect to the law and respect to individuals. So I've got a few questions. Um, Mr. Potts, should Facebook promote spirited debate on all sides of the political spectrum? And we'll do these as yes or no. Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, we allow spirited okay. debate on all Mr. Sides. Manji, same question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Potts, should Facebook allow ads urging that we save sea turtles or baby seals? I believe that would be fine. Okay. Mr. Manji, should Twitter allow ads that denounce Planned Parenthood for selling baby body parts? 
Ma'am, uh, thank you for that question, and I, uh, I'd like to again yes apologize no. for you. Yeah. Uh, every uh, every ad is uh, is judged uh, yes within context. Yes, no is good. And we made a mistake on your ad, and I apologize. Okay, uh, Mr. Manji, should Twitter allow ads from Starbucks and Patagonia? If they follow our terms of service. And Mr. Potts, should Facebook allow ads from Chick Fil A and Hobby Lobby? If they follow our ads uh, policies. Okay, and who sets those policies? Uh, there are. Uh, Teammates of mine, uh, we have uh, separate teams that work yeah. on ads policy. Are they subjective? Uh, they, objective? They, are, they are meant to be objective, Senator. They're meant to be objective. Do people they, bring they are, their I, attitudes to work with them? Uh, their I, political attitudes to work with them? I, I was incorrect in my statement. They are objective, and okay. uh, we, we okay. try to strive for okay, people Mr. not to Okay, Mr. Manji, should Twitter equally promote Democrats and Republicans in search rankings? Uh, yes, and we strive to. Mr. Potts, same question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Senator. Should you equally promote Democrats and Republicans in the search rankings? Yeah, okay. Yes, Senator. And Mr. Potts, should Facebook equally promote articles from all news sources, whether they're from the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post? For those who, yes, yes Senator. Okay. Um, we've got a presidential year coming up in 2020. So Mr. Manji, please tell me what Twitter is doing to prepare its platform for censorship-free debate. Thank you so much, uh, Senator. Uh, we, uh, we uh, people come to Twitter to figure out what's going on in the world and never is that more important than during elections. Uh, we spent a great amount of time in the lead up to the midterm elections, which were the most tweeted about midterm elections in history. We dramatically improved our ability to find uh, efforts at disinformation, improved our partnerships with all the major parties, uh, with the government and with NGOs to figure out uh, vectors of threats. Uh, and we had uh, what we believe was an incredibly clean election. Uh, and as the world turns, there are additional elections in the EU, in Japan, in India, uh, in um, Israel yesterday. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to try to uh, improve our systems, to find disinformation, uh, to make sure that there's greater context about who's speaking. Now, I know Facebook has hired a news director. Have you all hired a news director? We are structured differently than, than Facebook. Uh, we do, uh, I, I, as a platform, we are running towards news uh, and work with uh, news publishers of all, all sorts to make sure that they can get their, their, uh, their uh, products out on our, on our platform. Okay, and uh, Mr. Potts, uh, Facebook's plan, their strategy for 2020? Uh, thank you, Senator. We've hired over 30,000 people to focus on safety and security. We've made significant investments in what we call our election integrity. We have full-time standing teams that are now focused on many of the elections going on in the world, whether it be the EU, India, Israel, as we mentioned yesterday, but definitely focused on 2020 within the United States to ensure that we are, are out in front and to prevent any abuse that uh, could occur on the platform. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to have the committee stand in recess. Uh, as we are in the middle of the vote, I need to get to the floor and the chairman will return and we will continue questions with the first panel.
speech should be shut down because somehow there's a, I, I just, I don't follow from this how, I, I can understand how you could, you could say that a whole bunch of positions that are advocating the most extreme abortion laws that exist on earth, the US, China, North Korea, and Vietnam are the only nations that allow abortion until moments before delivery. Out of 200 countries, there are four on earth that do that. We're one of those four. There's clearly violence associated with that conversation. It's on the abortion advocate side of the debate. How is the pro-life side ever guilty of something that equates to violence? Like, how could a pro-life position ever be shut down because of safety? Uh, it's a great question, Senator. And to be clear, a lot of this depends on intent and, and the context that statements or images or videos are shared in, so it's hard to do the hypothetical. Um, but a general pro-life position would not be violating our uh, community standards for hate speech. I, the Mother Teresa quote did not vi would not violate ours. Uh, and, and to be uh, just for complete transparency, we consult a range of groups across the spectrum, across all political ideologies, uh, to try to help inform our policies. Now we own the policies, like we write them. They're ours. We own them. But we do inf we do talk to a lot of groups to make sure that we are landing, not being too aggressive on any area, and making sure that we try to strike that right balance between voice and safety. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Senator Sass. I want to turn to the topic of shadow bans. Uh, does Twitter or Facebook engage in shadow bans? No, sir. No, Chairman. So, Mr. Manje, and I apologize earlier for mispronouncing your name. Manje, is that correct? Thank you for asking, sir. It's hard. Uh, it's Monhe. Monhe. Okay. Yes, well, th thank, thank, thank you for clarifying. Mon Monhe. Mr. Mon Monhe, you, you, you testified before that, or you acknowledged that Twitter will downgrade a comment to make it less vi visible. Does Twitter notify a person if their comment has been downgraded? If I could explain uh, what we do and, and how some of our algorithms work, and it's, uh, it's precisely the kind of uh, difficult put and takes that, uh, that Senator Sass was, was mentioning earlier. I'll ask you to do so briefly. Uh, very briefly. Uh, what we do, and we're transparent in our rules about, about the fact that we do this, uh, that uh, if we have signals that indicate that uh, a person is being spammy, meaning they are using multiple accounts to do the same thing, if they are using automated activity, but we're not 100% sure that they're breaking our rules, if they've been abusive, uh, then uh, what we will do is make it harder for that content to be found in a couple of different places. One is in search results, and the other is in, uh, is in conversations, so in replies. Let me replies. ask you the question again. When you downgrade a tweet, do you <coughs> notify the person that you've downgraded it? Uh, we, uh, I'd have to get back to you on that, sir. Okay, I believe the answer is no, and, and if the answer is no, that, as far as I can tell, is all but indistinguishable from shadow banning. Now, uh, at, at, now, no let, point, let, at no let, point, let, sir. At no point, sir, is a person's followers unable to find uh, what that, per what that person tweeted. But if it's downgraded so far, far fewer people see it, that is e exactly what is being alleged on shadow banning. Now, let, let me take a different aspect of it. Um, in the opening round of questions, the ranking member asked both of you, and I tried to write this down as fast as I can, uh, something to the effect of, she said, do, do either of you say, oh, these are the words conservatives use, so we're just going to get rid of those, those positions. And, and, and both of you said no. Uh, Mr. Monhe, I'd like to refer you to a quote from a Twitter employee that was made public on a video this week, in, in which, strikingly, he said almost verbatim uh, what Senator Hirono asked. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Parne Singh said, who's a Twitter direct uh, messaging engineer, said, quote, you look for Trump or America, and you have like 5,000 keywords to describe a redneck the majority of the machine learning algorithms are for Republicans. Can, can I go back to the last quote that you had? In the break, we had the opportunity to actually look up what you... Sure. What, no, the, the reason you why is you, you took that quote out of context. If I could read the end of that quote sure. uh, on the... Uh, at the end of what he said was, uh, you were saying neutrality is not what we're aiming for. He said, I do believe we should optimize for impartiality. You know, there is a difference there. To me, neutrality is a lot more passive, a lot more hands-off. So. The end of the quote that you selectively picked uh, uh, right, was... How about, how about this one? This was uh, the Project Veritas video where um, I'm sure you understand their methods, uh, which we find to be deplorable, uh, which is they uh, approach people in a social setting. Uh, so this person was not representing Twitter. 
he was speaking uh, in, a, in a social situation. Some of these interviews, people thought they were on, on dates. Uh, they, people so thought they were on Twitter dates. Employee? When, I was a, when I was a single man, is, is I used to... Twitter employee? If I could finish. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if he was a current or, or, or past uh, employee when he was in... It, when, is what he's saying true or false? It's false. That's not, that's not our practices. We never use political ideology or party affiliation in any of our internal processes. Uh, that was big talk by somebody who thought we, he was on a date. All right, your testimony is this Twitter employee's uh, statements were, were, were false. All right. That is not, that is not our practice. Those aren't our practices. Let me, uh, Mr. Potts, you had a discussion with, uh, with Senator Sass about hate speech. Uh, I thought it was striking as you listed what you described as, as hate speech. You omitted one of the characteristics that you define as hate speech, which is gender identity. Uh, does, does Facebook consider the statement there are two genders to be hate speech? Depending on how that was shared, I would have to find out, but I, don't, I do not believe so, uh, Senator. I th that should be allowable. Well, uh, we will be interested, and, and indeed I asked... Uh. Facebook a whole series of questions about whether you have blocked posts along those lines and, and in the entire debate about, about marriage and same-sex marriage, there are people who have different views on that question. Uh, but I asked Facebook in writing if some of the views that, that uh, if they are deemed hate speech and, and, and Facebook refused to answer. I will say also, on the question of safety, uh, you, you did respond to me in writing that, or Facebook did rather, that people need to feel safe in order to build community. We are committed to removing content that encourages real-world harm, including but not limited to, so it might be something else too, physical, financial, or emotional injury. Now, I find it quite remarkable that, that, that Facebook is saying that, that, in your own words, you are committed to removing content that encourages emotional injury. That is about as nebulous a standard as I can imagine. And let me give an example. Look, my family, my, my aunt, my Thea Sonia, was imprisoned and tortured in Cuba by Castro's goons. In terms of emotional in injury, I find it offensive people who praise Fidel Castro as a man of the, uh, of the people. And yet, I would wager $1,000 that Facebook does not consider language praising Fidel Castro as hate speech, even though for families that have, have suffered and been tortured at, at his goon's hands, that causes emotional injury. Do you agree with me? Senator, I think you're bringing up an inter interesting point about the, uh, how, th how things are shared on the platform, the context and intent. And it's often hard for us to understand the context and intent of something shared. Now, if someone was targeting you or targeting your, your uh, unfortunately targeting your aunt, your aunt or a family member, with that type of language about a violent tragedy, we would actually remove that. But, to be but sure, a direct, a direct threat of violence is qualitatively different from, from a policy position or political position that, that someone may be offended or disagree with. We, we, none of us have a right to live in a world free uh, of being offended. We do have the ability to argue against it. And so if someone defends Castro as a man of the people, I'm more than happy to have that conversation with them. But silencing voices we disagree with is qualitatively different. I, I think if, if we, we're not in the, uh, we do not seek to silence any voice. And I, just to be clear again, if someone was mocking or trying to bully the victim of a violent tragedy, we would remove that. Um, I'm not familiar with the language, uh, I think, in the question that you may have submitted for the record. Um, where we responded with the emotions. I'm not exactly aware with that, of that language, so it's hard for me to uh, surmise or, or understand exactly what was the intent Mother. of that response. But if someone wanted to target one of your family members that was the, the victim of a violent tragedy directly and mock them, we would remove that. Have either of your companies done any internal studies to assess the extent of potential bias? Uh, Senator, I, I referenced one of them in my written testimony uh, about the, uh, the, the reach of uh, members of Congress, uh, which found a one-to-one -one correlation, uh, the most important factor being the number of followers. So I'm going to ask both of your companies, if you've done any studies, to submit those studies to this committee for review. Yes, sir. Has Facebook done any studies? Uh, Senator, we're currently un undergoing a study with uh, Senator Kyle. Uh, he is... Uh, continue his study. He has met with over 130 uh, conservative voices at this time, some members of Congress, in fact, uh, other uh, conservative voices. 
that study is ongoing. I'm not exactly sure where we are in the uh, in line with the study. We want to give him enough room to uh, to do it unimpeded. Um, if it becomes public, we'll obviously we'll follow up. Have either of your companies, or would either of your companies, consider a verbatim quote from the Bible to be hate speech? No, Senator. Senator, a verbatim quote uh, that is used. Uh, and cite it, so it's a bit easier to understand, again, the context and the intent, uh, we would allow that to uh, remain on our platform. So religious text. And the Torah and the Quran, same? The re religious text we would, we would allow. Twitter. I, I, I have to get back to you on the specifics, but I believe it would be possible to quote uh, any biblical or religious text in a way that is threatening to an individual, may God smite thee down or something like that, which would be an attack on an individual. Again, the context really matters. Uh, so absent a direct threat of physical violence? That sounds right, yes, sir. Twitter would not consider a quote from the Bible, the Quran, the Torah as, as hate speech, uh, and has not. Uh, the context matters and what the relationships and what the purpose of the speech is. Okay, uh, last, last question. Again, in writing, I asked, asked Facebook uh, when Mr. Zuckerberg testified um, about the ad rates you charge Democrats and Republicans, and in particular, if the average ad rate, for example, for the Clinton campaign was comparable to the average ad rate for the Trump campaign. Facebook refused to answer. I also asked Obama versus Romney, were the ad rates comparable? Facebook refused to answer. Indeed, Facebook refused to answer for any campaign. Um, do you know if there is a meaningful differential in the ad rates that Facebook charges Democrats versus Republicans? Uh, Senator, I'm here today to speak about our community standards. Uh, that's what I focus on. So I work on the development around user-generated content, all those policies around user-generated content. Uh, the ad space is not one that I'm very familiar with, and I definitely do not know any of the charging rates. Well, I would ask you to answer that uh, same question for Twitter. Thank you, sir. Uh, we uh, unveiled last year the Ads Transparency Center uh, that gives uh, people in America a chance to understand who's paying uh, for, uh, for an advertisement. Uh, uh, how much money they spent and what the, um, uh, what the results of that ad were. Uh, we're trying to be extremely transparent, and we think it's important that people understand who's paying for these ads. Senator Hirono. See, the thing is that we are trying to show, or at least the chairman is uh, uh, attempting to show that there actually is a conservative bias somehow through your algo uh, algorithms, whatever, against conservative viewpoints. So do you think it would be a, a good idea, for example, for your companies to have an algorithm to make sure there are equal number of pro-choice and pro-life posts? No, Senator. Why not? Senator, I believe our algorithm is designed to allow the free flow of ideas. Uh, if there are more pro-life posts, um, so be it. If there are more pro-choice posts, so be it. Uh, we just want the free flow of ideas to exist on, on the platform. Uh, how about you, Mr. Monhang? Yes, ma'am. Uh, similar to what uh, Facebook described, we have uh, certain categories that we don't allow uh, advertisers to touch, that we don't allow uh, data scientists or, or data partners to touch. Uh, and the, their, their political affiliation, things like that, are uh, follow along those lines. So we know that with one billion posts a day for Facebook, 500 million posts, well, tweets every single day, uh, there are going to be some uh, posts or tweets that are taken down that should not have been taken down. So I don't know whether it's the fault with your uh, algorithms or the, there is a human factor going on, but. <laughs> There are lots and lots of pretty vile things on both of your platforms that I would wish could be taken down. For example, it took you a long time, I would say both of you, to take down the shootings in New Zealand. It took a lot longer, and once it's out and out there, it can be retrieved, and so it's out there. So short of, in my view, short, short of uh, some kind of equivalency, of the kind of content, I don't know how we're supposed to be assured that there's no bias. But as you say, the platform is open. You have all these people posting different things. And it would seem as though that, for example, just to use an example of, uh, of choice, either choice or pro-life, that if you were to limit 
to an equal, equal number, you're going to be pushing out a lot of posts that don't meet that uh, numerical equivalent. So, you know, I think, I think there are just a lot of problems with uh, what we're talking about here. So, when we talk about whether or not there's been any kind of investigation into evidence of systemic political bias, I note that, uh, this is for you, Mr. Potts. In 2016, the website Gizmodo reported that curators suppressed conservative stories in Facebook's trending news section. In response, Facebook launched an internal investigation. I understand that the investigation found no evidence of system systemic political bias and that conservative and liberal topics were approved as trending topics at virtually identical rates. Can you provide some details about Facebook's internal review and what it found? Uh, Senator, I, I believe that top line is correct, that uh, we found no, uh, no difference, uh, no abuse of it, of that. Uh, the product trending topics has been discontinued, however. I do not have specifics to, at this point, but I'm happy to follow up if that's helpful. So this internal investigation, was that done by, um, I, I don't know what you mean by an internal investigation. You did it totally in-house? Senator, I will have to uh, go back to my team and we'll follow up with you. Again, for Mr. Potts, your opening statement, you stated, quote, unequivocally, unequivocally that Facebook does not favor one political viewpoint over another, nor does Facebook suppress conservative speech. Yet you mentioned Facebook has brought in former Republican Senator John Kyle to work with conservative groups to suggest improvements to Facebook. So despite there being no evidence of anti-conservative bias that I've seen um, in this hearing, Facebook is bending over backwards to placate conservative complaints about bias. Why is Facebook working so hard to address complaints of bias that it claims doesn't exist, a position supported by the data? Senator, uh, thank you for that question. I think uh, we recognize where our company is located. It's located in the heart of Silicon Valley, and Sam may argue that Silicon Valley uh, tends to be more liberal uh, th than not. Uh, we do a great job, in my opinion, of trying to manage our bias to ensure that we check your bias at the door. I mentioned that I've never been asked to write a policy based off of a political ideology, or uh, I've never been asked to make an enforcement decision based off a of political ideology, or sat on with a product team as they do, the engineers have developed a product and had that come into play. Uh, that being said, uh, I recognize that there is also the possibility of unconscious bias, and I think when we try to review uh, and ensure that there is no bias in the system, that you do these measures, so that a mature company seeks to find out if they have the, uh, perchance, unconscious bias in their product. Uh, so both on with Senator Kyle as well as with uh, Laura Murphy, we have undergone two. Laura Murphy is a civil rights leader, a uh, civil liberties uh, lawyer as well, uh, to ensure that we do not have bias on any side whether it be civil rights uh, against communities of color, other marginalized groups, whether it be against conservatives to ensure that those do not get into our system. So you have um, Senator, former Senator Kyle, uh, I guess representing the conservative perspective and the civil rights activists representing the, the liberal perspective so that you have both covered in your efforts to make sure there's no unconscious bias being reflected in your policies or in, in your algorithms? Is that, what, is that what you're telling me? We, we, have, uh, we have hired and, and engaged with uh, those two individuals to do an assessment of our, of our policies, of our processes, of our product to ensure that there is no, is no bias. Again, I'm not of the belief that there is bias. I know the teams that I work with, the diversity of viewpoints that are through leadership, uh, my team, uh, and the teams that we are fortunate enough to uh, share Facebook with at this time. Uh, but again, I, I'm recognize that we are also infallible and we're doing our best to ensure that uh, if there was bias that we can identify it and then stomp it out. We've been hearing a lot about Senator Blackburn's uh, advertisement being taken down. Earlier this year, Facebook removed ads posted by Democratic Senator and presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren. And in 2016, Mark Zuckerberg reprimanded Facebook staff for defacing Black Lives Matter postings on the walls of Facebook's Campus, is this proof that Facebook is biased against liberals? 
Does Facebook plan to bring former Senator Claire McCaskill to meet with liberal groups, although you do have the civil rights activists, to offer suggestions on how Facebook can be improved? Or is this an example of the acknowledgement that it's pretty tough to get it right perfectly? And we, of all people here, should know that, how tough it is to get things perfect around here. So you took down uh, Elizabeth Warren's ad. Did, uh, are, the, are her ads put back up the way you put back up Senator Blackburn's? Uh, y yes, Ranking Member. We did uh, incorrectly remove uh, Senator Warren's ad uh, once we recognized that we did, and recognizing that A, Senator Warren, uh, both as a senator and a presidential candidate, is much in the public discourse uh, that her ad also was in the public discourse. Uh, we removed it for a, a re, for a trademark reason, uh, but once we uh, recognized that uh, what was being discussed within the ad, we uh, reinstated it. Well, here's something that uh, I think really is a concern for, uh, for those of us who uh, care about discrimination uh, on your platform, Mr. Potts. So let's move from bias to out, outright discrimination. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development recently announced that it was charging Facebook with violating the Fair Housing Act by encouraging, enabling, and causing housing discrimination through the company's advertising platform. Facebook is charged with enabling advertisers to exclude people based upon their neighborhood by drawing a red line around those neighborhoods on a map. So unlike claims of anti-conservative bias, these are serious allegations of conduct that inflicts real harm on Americans. Does Facebook now or did Facebook ever enable advertisers to exclude people based on their neighborhood by drawing a red line around those neighborhoods on a map? Uh, Senator, I'm not unfamiliar with the red line, but I would like to say that our policies, our advertising policies prevent uh, wrongful discrimination, uh, especially in the context of housing or employment or credit around zip codes, around age, around gender. Uh, in fact, we've reached a historic settlement with a few of the leading civil rights organizations, the National, Her National Fair Housing Alliance, as well as the ACLU recently. Uh, the HUD complaint, or the HUD uh, investigation and now lawsuit, uh, came as a surprise. We had a lot of meaningful conversations. I, we thought we were working to uh, work through their issues, uh, and then we were uh, just frankly surprised uh, that they, went, they moved forward with the suit. Well, I would think that HUD has, I hope, some kind of a, a basis for what they charged with, you with. So you've done what, you've, you've reviewed your uh, platforms, your algorithms to make sure that uh, discriminatory advertising is not permitted on your platform? That is correct. For wrongful discrimination uh, of advertising, we prohibit, it, uh, we prohibit our advertisers from engaging in that behavior. Uh, and when, we're fat, when we are made aware, we do uh, limit and restrict their access to advertising. Uh, these are con constant conversations. We're continually uh, improving our policies uh, where, there may, where they may fall short, uh, but we do prohibit discrimination. So is Facebook advertising. engaging in negotiations with HUD over this allegation, or have they filed a, a lawsuit? Uh, Senator, I believe HUD has filed a lawsuit. I am not a, a uh, lawyer that works on this or a lawyer for the company for that matter. Uh, so I, I can't speak to those issues, but I'm happy to find yeah, I'd be interested to know if, uh, if uh, Facebook is trying to get the lawsuit dismissed based on um, what you told us, but uh, we shall see. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hirono. And I'll note that Senator Hirono referenced Elizabeth Warren. Um, Senator Warren, I, I invited her to testify at this hearing along with Senator Blackburn. Uh, Senator Warren uh, informed us that her schedule didn't, did not allow her to do so, but, but I'll note that Senator Warren tweeted the following. Curious why I think Facebook has too much power. Let's start with their ability to shut down a debate over whether Facebook has too much power. Thanks for restoring my posts, but I want a social media marketplace that isn't dominated by a single censor, hashtag break up big tech, and I will tell you in response to that tweet, for the first time ever in my life, I retweeted Senator Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to respond to a suggestion that was made a moment ago by one of my colleagues to the effect that there's harm on both sides, to the effect that, if I understood the comment correctly, sometimes the discrimination against ideas on social media networks cut one way politically and sometimes they cut the other way politically. 
that may be true as far as those words go in and of themselves, but it's a blatant mischaracterization of anyone's perception of the way these social media networks operate. As I understand our two witnesses today, they're not disputing the fact that there is a problem. Now, it may be just a problem of corporate culture within their respective companies, but there is a problem. There is rather blatant bias in one direction politically. I mean, we saw it just a few minutes ago uh, in my interaction with Mr. Potts. You know, a, a, an image of a baby uh, uh, when used by the Susan B. Anthony advertisement gets taken down. And it doesn't get taken down when a comparable image of a baby in a hospital, even a baby that's premature and undergoing medical treatment, doesn't get taken down. It's not lost on any of us that this cuts overwhelmingly one direction and not the other. That doesn't mean we can't identify aberrational examples, uh, examples of where it cuts the other direction. But I, I don't hear either one of you disputing or making any attempt to refute the idea that we do have a political bias issue here. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's uh, the government's issue to resolve. It doesn't mean that we own your companies and can tell you what to do. But insofar as you would have your users suggest and believe that you are somehow a politically neutral forum, that's laughable. No one assumes that to be true, and I don't hear you saying that. Uh, Mr. Monhey, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I heard you mention something a few minutes ago in reference uh, to questions from the chairman about this statement by Jack Dorsey. The statement was, I don't believe that we can afford to take a, natural, a neutral stance anymore. I don't believe we should optimize for neutrality. Um, you gave context for that quote, and I don't have the written version of that in front of me. Can you give me the context for that again? I appreciate it uh, very much, sir. Um, what he was distinguishing was the two words, neutrality versus impartiality, and that we were aiming for impartiality, which is more action-focused as opposed to a more passive uh, in neutrality. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I understand the distinction for purposes of our discussion today. Can, can you help me understand why that makes any difference for the problem we're, we're identifying? That uh, we work extremely hard, and the people that come to Twitter every day work extremely hard to make sure that people on all sides of every debate and three quarters of our users overseas uh, have the opportunity to, to talk about what it is they care about and not have the platform be the, the subject of the, of the discussion. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, creating a safe environment uh, where people uh, aren't facing uh, threats of violence or threats of rape uh, child sexual exploitation. These are, these are, it takes active effort, and that's what uh, Jack yeah. was talking about. And I, I understand that. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I don't hear you refuting the notion that there is some bias within the company politically. By the way, how would you characterize your corporate culture as it relates to the political world? W would you characterize it as particularly conservative? I would uh, politely disagree with the premise of your question and, and say that I disagree with, with what you're saying, is that we work every day to make sure that, that our platform is impartial and that everybody can come to it to speak. Uh, and people don't come to Twitter to work uh, because of, you know, they're on one side of one issue or the other. Yeah, I, whether, I, I whether haven't suggested that, and I resent your suggestion that well, I've suggested I, that. I, 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 are are you sorry. suggesting to me, sir, that your, your um, uh, workforce and the, and the people who monitor the content of what's posted on Twitter I'm, I'm are, are equally Republican and Democratic? Surely you're not suggesting that. I, I, I'm sorry if I offended you. I, I don't understand how I did. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you that uh, we have a, a global uh, audience, uh, we have a global workforce, and they come to Twitter to build a platform uh, where people can find out what's happening in the world and talk about what's happening in the world. And, uh, and it, is in, it is in our interest as a company, it is in our interest as our advertiser to have eyeballs that, that care about all these issues. Yeah, not my question. Uh, my, my question, with respect, sir, is uh, about your workforce. Uh, do you think your workforce uh, has the ability to engage in self-reflection, in meaningful self-criticism, with regard to whether or not it's filtering content in a politically neutral manner? I think that is an excellent question. I, I, I think Senator Sass mentioned something earlier that I, I go back to, which is if we were running a, a, a sandwich shop, uh, it's liking it to have a board, a, a comment board at the front that allowed anybody to say, the ham sandwiches here are terrible. 
the, ter the tuna sandwiches are terrible. And that's what Twitter allows, is a platform that not, not only allows people on all sides of the debate, but also to criticize us. We found out about, uh, about Senator Hawley's uh, uh, letter to us because he tweeted it. That's, that's the kind of open environment that we're trying to build and that every employee comes to Twitter to do. What about the kind of environment that allows someone to say uh, abortion is terrible or abortion is a fundamental right? Is that equally important? Those, those conversations happen on Twitter every day. They do. And are you suggesting that they are treated in an ambidextrous fashion? We strive to do that every day, yes. You, you strive to do that. Uh, what about you, Mr. Potts? Uh, how would you describe your corporate culture within Facebook? Uh, thank you, Senator. There was one thing that you said that I, I agree that we have political bias. I want to be very clear. I've said a, a few times in this hearing that I don't think we have political bias. I do not think we have political bias. I do not think we have uh, an, a strong issue against marginalized communities either. Uh, that, what I did say is that there is the room for unconscious bias that we do not recognize, and that is why we're doing those assessments. But again, I want to just be for extreme clarity that I do not believe that we have this issue. And so I don't think that that bias exists uh, at, at Facebook. Now, now, to the question of co corporate culture, I think within our, uh, within our Bay Area-based office, it probably does, uh, we would probably have more liberal or people who identify as Democrats than we do as Republicans. We are a global company. We have a large presence in, in Texas. We have a large presence here in DC, as well as New York. We have a large presence in Dublin. We have a large presence in Singapore. So we are a global company. And I, would, I am not the correct person to ask what everyone's political ideology is, because we don't do a survey on that yeah. either. And, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to suggest that you should. And I, I would find that thought horrifying that we as a Congress would ever suggest that you should. But since we're having a conversation about um, whether or not you're able to operate a forum that is at least perceived as having a certain degree of objectivity and neutrality, um, and since we've established, I think, that in many circumstances you end up with disparate treatment of very, very similar images. And it, look, this is unmistakable, and, and it's insofar as you're suggesting that this doesn't produce very different outcomes on the right from the outcomes that are achieved on the left. That is laughable. And so I, I, I'm asking you, are, are we crazy in perceiving this? Or are we wrong? Or, or, or is, is, could there possibly be something about your procedures that are not capable of uh, of monitoring and maintaining a, a politically neutral uh, forum for discussion. Senator, again, we are a platform for diversity of viewpoints. Uh, your question about the disparate impact of our policies as they apply to any group, whether that be conservative, whether that be a marginalized group, and how those policies are actually enforced, and that it produces a, uh, an outcome that is unintended, something that we take very seriously. We do some research, we're trying to do more research, but that's also why we have hired and engaged Senator Kyle, Laura Murphy, to see, to collect these anecdotes. To hear well, that's great, the but, I, but I heard you say a few minutes ago, yeah. that you're gonna have Senator Kyle go and talk to conservative groups. That's great. I, I, I really don't know what that's supposed to do. H having Senator Kyle interact with other conservatives, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know what that does for Facebook. I don't know what that should do for anyone who's concerned about whether or not this is able to operate as uh, a platform that presents itself to the world with a degree of neutrality. Um, I, I am not a, uh, a constitutional scholar, so I, I can't speak. This doesn't require. Right. right. Uh, this is fair. not even about the Constitution. I'm just asking about the political neutrality of Facebook as it's perceived by the world. There is no constitutional issue here. I, that, that, is, that is fair, Senator. I was going to, to really try to uh, go back to the disparate impact of rules. And I think part of that in the study, you, you need to hear those anecdotes to collect the information, the data, to actually see, to find which policies that may be uh, ripe for uh, review to see if those are actually violating. So I, I don't know how you get to, you can't really review the policy without hearing where you think it's being misapplied, if that, if that makes sense. That's the way I, I interpret it. Now I'm not, again, I'm not the one carrying out the uh, review, so I don't know how their methodology she is going, but if I was to run the review, I would need to collect the data of where we thought the policy was misapplied, where it is having that impact, then I would look to the policy to say, okay, how did you write this? What is the intended? And then how is it being enforced? That's, that's how I would go about it. Now, Senator Kyle, Laura Murphy, they have their own processes. They have their own ways of going about it. So I can't speak to them. 
But that's kind of the first point where I would start to, so I would go out and collect those anecdotes, collect where I think, okay, is it the case that we over-enforce on pro-choice content, or is it the case that we over-enforce on pro-life content? Bring that back and see what policies apply, and then work through the process, say, you know what, you actually do over-enforce in this area. Why is that? And then you can find, I think you'll find answers. Yeah. That, <clears throat> look, there are no easy solutions here, and I, I don't mean to suggest by any of this that I, that I envy your, your position or that I think this is an easy thing. But I, I will suggest that if I were to run um, a social media, a global social media network, uh, we'll call it uh, Cruise Book, uh, <clears throat> from my hometown of Alpine, Utah, and I were to staff it entirely from people with people from Alpine, Utah, who share my political worldview uh, more than people outside of my hometown of Alpine, Utah, it would probably produce a different discussion than what you have with a company that's overwhelmingly run by people with a very different political worldview and political philosophy than I do. And I would, uh, you didn't ask for it, but I, I would respectfully suggest that that's one of the things you ought to be looking to. It's great that you've got Senator Kyle talking to conservative groups. I think that's fantastic. I don't think that's gonna change anything as long as your corporate culture remains as it is overwhelmingly to one side. That is entirely your prerogative as a company if you want to do that, but I don't know that that's necessarily where you want to be or how you're portraying yourself to the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, and I look forward to utilizing Senator Lee's upcoming social media network. Um, I, I will note, by the way, both of y'all pressed back on saying you, you don't know the political leanings of your employees. The Facebook CEO, Mr. Zuckerberg, when he testified here, in his own words, characterized Silicon Valley as, quote, an extremely left-leaning place. And, and so I think anyone is denying reality to, to, to suggest otherwise. Uh, Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just for the record, uh, you don't take surveys or polls among your employees as to what they believe about any given political issues, do you? No, Senator. Mr. Monge? No, sir. And so your views are intuitive guesses. Is that more or less correct? I believe that's correct, Senator, just uh, based off our location. But again, we do not take surveys. It's not data accurate. Uh, I would not hold it out to be true. Same for you, Mr. Monge. Uh, yes, sir. We don't survey people. I, I, most of my, the entire government relations team is, is behind me here, and we've got Republicans and Democrats, and we, we argue about SEC football more than anything else. And, and I think we are experienced enough in the world of media, newspaper, and other kind of coverage to know that bias and uh, leanings are very much in the eye of the beholder. When we see a story that mentions us favorably, we think it's great. When it takes aim at us, many of us take umbrage. And so the, the kind of views that have been elicited here, and maybe of Mark Zuckerberg as well, and about Silicon Valley are very much emotional, non-fact-based, non-scientific reactions. And in fact, compared to other parts of the country, Silicon Valley may not be all that left-leaning. Would you agree? Uh, that's an interesting uh, question, Senator. I I've not, I've not done a, a survey of Silicon Valley. I see a lot of Democrats. I think there are a lot of libertarians as well. And I'm sure there are a lot of, I live much further East Bay than others. And uh, I have a lot of Republican and conservative neighbors. A good question to an, an un, a good answer to an unfair question. So uh, let me just move on uh, to say, uh, as I ask this question, I should disclose that my son, Matthew Blumenthal is a trial lawyer in Bridgeport with a firm named Koskoff, Koskoff and Beter that represents Robbie Parker, who also happens to be one of my constituents. Uh, he represents Mr. Parker in an action involving threats and harassment against him and others who lost children at Sandy Hook. Uh, Robbie Parker is going to be testifying, assuming we are done with this panel in time. And uh, 
he, along with many other Sandy Hook families, reported specific harmful content published on Facebook that subjected them to online and offline harassment. I have no connection other than through my son with that litigation, but I disclose it in the interests of uh, simply indicating what, what uh, personal involvement I may have. Uh, in Mr. Parker's written testimony, he mentions that these families made years of requests of Facebook to remove that harmful content, years of requests. Only recently, once this content became publicized, commonly known, and uh, the subject of press attention, in fact, uh, has Facebook reacted to these reports and begun to remove it? Facebook's delay facilitated the nationwide spread of this threatening and harassing content, which resulted in serious and lasting harm to my constituents. That is a fact that in, indeed will be proven in court at some point. When I learned about this harassment, which was quite some time ago, uh, my heart broke for these families. This kind of harassment, threats, and other extraordinarily repugnant content had lasting damage for many of these families. We don't know for sure, but it may have also played a part in the suicide most recently of uh, the dad of one of those children, Abiel Richmond. Uh, Jeremy Richmond killed himself just uh, a few weeks ago. So this kind of uh, repulsive content has real life consequences. And I would like to know, uh, Mr. Potts, when someone like Mr. Parker reports that he is being harassed, what steps are taken by Facebook to review that content? Thank you, Senator. And, and again, um, take a pause. By my heart goes out to those, uh, the victims, uh, goes out to Mr. Parker uh, as a uh, father of three with two uh, school-aged children who are uh, roughly the age of the victims uh, in Sandy Hook, as well as a wife who's a school teacher. I, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit rough, so I, I, uh, I can only imagine the, the harassment uh, that he felt that he, online um, and experienced. Uh, uh, my heart goes out to him. Uh, when someone reports content, uh, to us, we do remove it. We do review it under our community standards. Uh, we review it for vi uh, all violations, uh, whether they are credible threats of violence, whether they are bullying, whether they are harassment, and if it satisfies those com community standards, uh, we remove it. Um, as you've noted, we have now a policy that prevents the harassment of the survivors of violent tragedies, uh, comments that would target the victims of violent tragedies, as in case of the children, uh, if there are comments where uh, someone targets them and calls them a crisis actor or says that the event has not happened, uh, we would remove that content, we would remove it swiftly. Um, to the point, uh, Senator, we, we try to move as quickly as possible and perhaps in this case we did not move fast enough. How long does it generally take now for Facebook to contact that person or that entity to remove the harmful content? Uh, Senator, we try to uh, turn that content around. As you say, our, our, our operating time to remove that content is uh, roughly 24 hours is kind of the expected time frame, but it's often much, much faster than that. And what do you do to stop it from spreading in the meantime? If we find uh, for, for that type of content, especially around what you are naming uh, this type of uh, viral content, if we know of things like uh, hashtags, uh, which are becoming more and more prominent, obviously prominent on Twitter, uh, places like Instagram as well. We do try to limit discoverability, uh, reducing that, uh, those types of comments, 
and, uh, and hashtags in our search products. So uh, you cannot aggregate, uh, especially on Instagram, uh, those types of, uh, that type of content, I should say, that would target somebody on the basis of them being a victim of a violent tragedy. And you, you know you have a set of protections under Section 230 that uh, afford you a high degree of, in effect, immunity or shield from liability for the content that appears on your platforms. But uh, I really think you have a responsibility, may not be a legal responsibility, but a moral responsibility to protect people like Mr. Parker, and he's just one example of the Sandy Hook families, and they are just a few examples of the victims, ongoing victims of this kind of harassment. What can you do to deter this kind of harassing and threatening message that is so disruptive and destructive to people's lives? Uh, Senator, thank you. We, we do have... Uh 30,000 people who now focus on safety and security, and, and many of those focus on this type of behavior. It is doing, it's ensuring that we are responsive to reports, it is when we can proactively surface these things through the use of our artificial intelligence and machine learning, getting it before reviewers so they can remove it uh, before it is even reported by a user. And of course, if we have repeated bad actors uh, to remove uh, not only their content, but if, if they are egregious, we will also remove their profiles. Uh, there are a few people who I would say trade in this type of behavior and we have removed their pages uh, that for repeated violations of our hate speech policy, the policies that apply to uh, this type of, of harassment as well. Uh, and we just need to continue to refine our policies, ensure we're faster, ensure the processes are strong, and continue to work. I understand you have audits underway. Uh, both uh, Twitter and Facebook have audits underway, correct? Uh, for Facebook, that is correct, Senator. We have, uh, we have uh, assessments uh, by Senator Kyle as well as Laura Murphy uh, doing a civil rights assessment. And uh, that's true of Twitter as well, I believe, correct? Uh, Mr. We, Dorsey, as a matter of fact, made those audits known. Uh, we've, we've done a study uh, to get ready for this uh, hearings and other hearings to talk about uh, the impact of uh, how uh, tweets from members of Congress reach uh, their users. Will you commit to making public the audits that you're doing? Yes, sir. Mr. Potts? Our civil rights audit is currently public now. We've issued the first, uh, the first report in January uh, that, that is ongoing. Uh, Senator Kyle's re, uh, assessment is uh, still ongoing. I'm not sure of the status of that, but if we make it public, we will definitely share with you, sir. If you make it public, you will definitely share it with us. Will you commit to making it? Uh, maybe I misheard you, I'm sorry. No, I, I think you did hear me correctly. Uh, I don't know the status of it in the uh, whether we were committed to making that public, but I will definitely find out and I will come back to you. If sir. you could let us know, I'd appreciate it. I will do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and let me emphatically agree with Senator Blumenthal's comments, both that, that the audits of both companies should be made public, but, but also that those spreading vile lies about the Sandy Hook families are, are reprehensible. Uh, and I would note that if Congress were to repeal Section 230 of the CDA, that Facebook and Twitter and Google would face liability for slander and libel, which would have resulted in those malicious lies being pulled down much, much earlier, just like every other media publication is liable for, for slander and libel. Uh, with that, we're going to move to the second panel. Uh, before we do that, I do want to enter into the record two different documents. Uh, the first is an op-ed by Kay Coles James, who is the president of the Heritage Foundation, uh, and that op-ed ran today in today's Washington Post. Uh, Ms. James uh, was named to an ethics advisory council by Google, and some 2,500 employees of Google signed a petition to have her removed from that panel, and indeed those, those over 2,500 Google employees said about Ms. James by appointing uh, K. Cole James to, to the advisory council, Google elevates and endorses her views, implying that hers is a valid perspective worthy of inclusion in its decision making. This is unacceptable. Ms. James' op-ed is a powerful response to it that, among other things, observes that she is a, quote, 69-year-old black woman who grew up fighting segregation. And it illustrates uh, a very extreme view to consider the president of the Heritage Foundation someone whose views 
uh, are, are not, whose perspectives are not worthy of inclusion. So without objection, I want to enter her op-ed into the record. And secondly, uh, is an article today by Brendan Carr in the National Review entitled, Facebook Forgets the First Amendment, and it highlights how CEO Mark Zuckerberg's recent call for more government regulation of speech is a call for a censorship regime that would violate Americans' fundamental rights. And without objection, both will be entered into the record. Uh, senators, we, we will keep the record open for two weeks from today. Uh, senators are asked to submit any questions to the witnesses in writing, and the witnesses are asked to respond to those questions as soon as possible. And with that, I will thank both of you uh, for being here at this hearing and would call forward the second panel. Now I'll introduce our witnesses on the second panel. Uh, the first witness is Mr. Chuck Konzelman. Chuck Konzelman is a writer and director who is focused on films with a Christian message. Most recently, he wrote and directed the movie Unplanned, uh, a, the true story of one woman's journey from being one of the youngest Planned Parenthood clinic directors in the nation to becoming a pro-life advocate. And, and I have to say, having seen the film myself, it is extraordinarily powerful. I would encourage everyone regardless of where you fall on the abortion debate, to, to watch this film and, 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 and confront uh, the, the powerful and true story that it relays. Uh, Mr. Konzelman has a long and successful career in the secular entertainment industry. He's worked with Warner Brothers, Paramount, Sony Columbia, and 20th Century Fox, and sold original concept TV pilots to CBS, ABC, and Fox. In 2008, he and his friend Kerry Solomon decided to embark on a new path. Moved by their faith, they left the secular entertainment field and began working on films promoting a Christian message, including God's Not Dead, another wonderful film, and Do You Believe? Uh, Mr. Konzelman is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Our second uh, uh, witness is Dr. Francesca uh, Tripodi, I hope I pronounced that close to correctly, um, who is an assistant professor of sociology at James Madison University and an affiliated researcher at Data and Society. Dr. Tripodi's research focuses on how partisan groups interact with media and the role community plays in understanding what constitutes news and information. Dr. Tripodi received her PhD from the University of Virginia. Congratulations on the national championship, however traumatic it was for everyone in Texas. She received her MA in sociology from the University of Virginia as well an MA in Communications, Culture, and Technology from Georgetown University, and her BA in Communications from the University of S Southern California. The next witness is the Honorable Marilyn Musgrave. She is a former Congresswoman and is Vice President of Government Affairs at the Susan B. Anthony List, an organization that seeks to reduce and ultimately end abortion in the United States. Congresswoman Musgrave joined the Susan B. Anthony List after a distinguished career in public service. She served three terms in the United States House of Representatives, representing Colorado's 4th District, and before that, she was a two-term member of the Colorado House of Representatives and a member of the Fort Morgan School Board. Before seeking elected office herself, she was a hard-charging volunteer for the campaigns of numerous conservative candidates, as well as president of her local Right to Life chapter. She is a graduate of Colorado State University. Uh, Mr. Robbie Parker. Mr. Robbie Parker is the husband of Alyssa Parker and the father of three girls, Madeline, Samantha, and Emil. Emil was one of the young children tragically killed in the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in December 2012. Since the shooting, Mr. Parker and his family have been the targets of online conspiracy theorists who falsely and maliciously assert that he is a crisis actor and that the Sandy shooting was, was a hoax. Welcome, sir.
Professor Eugene Kontorovich is our final witness. Uh, professor Kontorovich is a professor of law at the Scalia Law School at George Mason University. He is an expert in multiple different fields of law, including constitutional law, universal jurisdiction, and international law, and he has written extensively on First Amendment issues in a variety of contexts. He has published over 30 major scholarly articles and book chapters in leading law reviews and peer-reviewed journals in both the United States and Europe. He has also written numerous essays, op-eds, white papers, reviews, and blog posts addressing some of the most complex legal issues of the day. Although Pro Professor Kontorovich began his academic career at, at George Mason Scalia Law School and is now a full professor there, in between, he spent two years at the University of Chicago Law School and over a decade at Nor Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law. He attended the University of Chicago for college and law school and clerked for Judge Richard Posner on the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the Seventh Circuit. Uh, with that, I will ask each of the witnesses to stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Mr. Councilman, you may begin. Senator Cruz, members of the committee, I appear here today with my lifelong friend and business partner, Carrie Solomon, who is my co-writer, co-director, co-producer of the film Unplanned, which is the true life story of Abby Johnson, a former Planned Parenthood surgical abortion clinic director, who, after seeing an abortion take place in real time on a sonogram screen, the image created via the ultrasound probe that Abby herself was holding turned her entire worldview upside down and became a pro-life advocate. That film is playing in theaters nationwide as we speak. From the outset, making a pro-life film in a pro-choice town, Los Angeles, we knew we would face a number of challenges. Moving past the challenges of production and post-production and limiting my comments to the marketing campaign, please allow me to highlight some of those. The MPAA saddled us with an R rating, which strongly dis discourages much of the Christian audience and all of the Church of Latter-day Saints from seeing our film, since they have a general prohibition against seeing R-rated films. It also precluded us from using the single most effective form of motion picture advertising, paid placement of our theatrical trailer before other films and theaters. But with an R rating, we were prohibited from advertising before anything other than other R-rated films without special permission, which we sought and were denied. We also looked to advertise on cable television, but with the exception of Fox News and CBN, we were systematically denied access to the outlets where we sought to advertise, among which were Lifetime, UpTV, Hallmark, HGTV, USA Network, Food Network, The Travel Channel, DIY, and The Cooking Channel. Lifetime, which is owned by A&E Networks, a joint venture of Walt Disney and Hearst Communications, told our buyers that they were refusing due to the, quote, sensitive nature of the film, unquote, but had previously promoted an interview with Scarlett Johansson in which she touted the benefits of Planned Parenthood. We consider these blanket refusals highly unusual and highly discriminatory and are formally petitioning the FCC to look further into the matter. In this environment, we rather naturally looked to go to social media with our advertising spend. But once again, we found ourselves stymied. Google Ads, formerly known as Google AdWords, blocked the entirety of the unplanned pre-release banner ads, which I should probably point out consisted of a woman, half of her face with a tear coming down and the words saying what she saw changed everything. I don't think they were particularly offensive. For the effectiveness of Google advertising, we will quote Google itself. When you advertise, with, when you advertise on the Google Display Network, which has over two million sites and reaches over 90% of the people on the internet, your ads can appear across a large collection of websites, mobile apps, and video content. There the quote ends. We were convinced of the advisability of advertising with Google, but we were blocked from doing so. Google cited a policy regarding abortion-related ads. Just one problem, we weren't doing abortion-related ads, we were marketing a movie. It's important to note that this prohibition was solidly in place for the entire lead up to our theatrical release. Why is this important? Because much like advertising spent in a political campaign, the vast majority of dollars spent in promoting a film are spent to help build up a white hot intensity and awareness around one particular date. But instead of election night, for films it's Friday night of opening weekend. 
because that all important opening weekend's results determine the course of the film's theatrical run and even how much it will make in ancillary markets and overseas. And after the film's release, Google came up with yet another restriction concerning event ticket sales, one which our film's marketers had never come across or even heard of in multiple similar campaigns. In short, we firmly believe that they were sharpshooting us, hiding behind highly selective and discriminatory enforcement of their own guidelines. It's impossible for me to quantify the damage done by Google's refusal, but it's absurd to think that there wasn't damage done. But we weren't finished with social media woes. Within hours of our theatrical debut, in the early morning hours of Saturday, March 30th, the film's Twitter account, technically the account owned by the film's single purpose marketing entity, was suspend, suspended. The reason for that suspension has not, to the best of my knowledge, been made clear beyond being accidental or a mistake. However, when such accidents occur within 12 hours of the film's theatrical debut, and after what I understand was nine months of ownership, during which time there were zero suspensions, the glitch becomes suspect. The uproar came quickly and was loud. Apparently, a number of media personalities, including Shannon Bream of Fox News, conservative commentator Dana Lash, and television personality and pro-life supporter Patricia Heaton were aware of the situation and made it known from their own social media platforms. If any progressive or left-leaning pundits or influencers came to our support on the basis of principle, we are unaware of it. Within two hours after the suspension service was restored, although it's also my understanding that our posting of a Twitter announcement with words to the effect of, we're back, was deleted from the account without explanation. Later on the same day, Twitter apparently deleted the vast majority of those listed as followers on our account, reducing the number from something on the order of 200,000 to less than 200, a thousand to one reduction in our listed followers. And numerous people, including the subject of our film, Abby Johnson, and the star of our film, Ashley Bratcher, found themselves unable to read or follow their own movie on Twitter. Dana Lash's tweet of 11.21 p.m. on the same day read, and here I quote, about five minutes ago, I was following at Unplanned Movie, and then I just checked after seeing so many say they had trouble even following the account, and somehow I wasn't following them anymore. The quote ends here. Again, this was during our all-important first weekend of rele release. Begging the question, why does this always seem to happen to conservatives? Or as the overtly satirical website, the Babylon Bee, put it, quote, meanwhile, Planned Parenthood, an organization that actually kills babies every single day, still had an active Twitter account in good standing, unquote. Interestingly, on the one social media platform from today, today's panel where we didn't have any significant problems, on Facebook, our exposure exploded. And I believe the, faves, the film's Facebook site had something on the order of about 12 million trailer views by the time of our theatrical debut, and nearly 18 million to date. We credit this unrestricted access with much of the film's success only highlighting the importance of access to social media. For the record, we allege no collusion between any of the social media or cable entities, at least not in the formal sense. They require no coordinated communication or agreement between them because they are unanimously progressive in their orientation, political beliefs, and worldview, and likewise strongly predisposed towards stifling conservative thought. But as evidence that this discrimination is one-sided, I posit this question to the committee. There are a number of pro-choice films currently in devel development in Hollywood. I will mention two. Let Her Speak, the story of Wendy Davis's pro-choice filibuster on the floor of the Texas Senate, to which Sandra Bullock is attached to star. And This Is Jane, being produced by Amazon Prime, which tells the story of an underground abortion provider network in pre-Roe versus Wade, Chicago. Is there any member of this committee who would like to go on record as saying they honestly expect that either of those films will have trouble in buying advertising on Google or otherwise? I think not, because they won't. Unless perhaps this committee elects to remember and closely examine whether standards are applied evenly. Unless anyone be tempted to dismiss our film as some sort of right-wing rant or conservative propaganda, I will quote from the final lines of an article by Mark Thiessen of the Washington Post and reprinted in the New York Post, neither of which are generally regarded as bastions of conservative thought. Here I quote, ultimately the movie is a testament to the power of prayer. Abby's family prays for her to leave Planned Parenthood, but they never reject her. They know she is a good person who does not yet understand the evil of abortion. There are millions like her. The film's goal is to reach them by showing us the humanity of the unborn child. This is why abortion supporters don't want you to see unplanned. See it anyway. The quote ends here. That is a Washington Post journalist description 
of the movie that social media went out of its way to restrict public awareness of. In closing, if social media is allowed to presumptively and preemptively dismiss conservative thought as controversial, divisive, or too sensitive, then that is what it will continue to do. If they're allowed to apply their own broadly drawn guidelines to dismiss one side of controversial issues, the side they don't agree with, and do so with impunity, then they will do so. It's all too easy to label conservative thought as con controversial or divisive, dismiss it as contrary to their guidelines, or roll out the dreaded phrase, hate speech. But in a digital age, exclusion from the digital arena isn't just discriminatory. It's the most insidiously effective form of censorship available or imaginable. Senator Cruz and the Ju Ju Judiciary Committee members, thank you for your attention. It's been an honor for Carrie Solomon and myself to be here, and we hope to be able to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Consulman. Dr. Tripodi. Before I get started, I want to thank everyone for their opportunity to let me speak on my research behalf. I'm a professor of sociology at James Madison University, and for the last decade, I have conducted international and domestic research on the interplay between technology and society. In my testimony today, I will argue three points. Search engines are primarily shaped by the key words that we enter. Second, that conservative content creators excel at search engine and social media optimization. And third, that conspiracy theories thrive when legitimate content is absent. Google, including its subsidiary YouTube, is the most powerful search engine in the world. It works by scanning the entire internet to find web pages and other content that best match the keywords entered. The system reads in metadata which is really just a fancy term for tags that are written into the content to help make it searchable. We think of algorithms as magic, but what's happening is very simple. Google transforms our input into a value. Most of the accusations about silencing are focused on output, but what my research reveals is that our results are more likely shaped by input, the key words that we enter into the search bar. Take, for example, two very similar searches surrounding an advertisement paid for by Americans for Prosperity during the Virginia governor's race. The ad argued that the Democratic candidate was incompetent because he had approved the spending of 1.4 million in taxpayer money to a fake Chinese company. If you Googled Northam fake Chinese company on January 25th, 2018, you are provided with both a conservative take on how Northam was scanned, as well as information from factcheck.org assessing the legitimacy of the claims. However, focusing on fiscal responsibility and including the phrase 1.4 million returned dramatically different, exclusively conservative content. This was an opinion piece by the Republican Governors Association, an op-ed by a conservative politician, and links directing users back to Americans for Prosperity. This is also true when you consider the phrase Russia collusion. In May of last year, Google actually autofilled the search to include the phrase delusion. And as of this week, when you key in Russian collusion delusion, a majority of the returns support the conservative perspective that allegations against Trump were unsubstantiated. If one were inclined to believe that the assertion of conservatism is being silenced and search for more info about conservative censorship, you will find that Google does not attempt to repress the accusations, but instead returns a series of links and videos that affirm the threat is real. Marketers use search engine optimization to try and maximize the likelihood that Google will return links back to their cause or company. It is clear that conservative production companies have an acute understanding of how this works. For example, if you analyze the metadata of PragerU videos on YouTube, the company tags just as many of their videos as Democrat as they do Republican. They tag more of their videos with feminism or the Women's March than with the word conservative. 
This strategy increases the likelihood that their videos will appear when people search for or engage with a range of ideological concepts. For example, the top result on YouTube when you search the phrase social justice is a PragerU video that currently has over 1.1 million views. So contrary to the claim that conservatism is being silenced, these marketing tactics amplify conservative positions to audiences who might even be searching for information on more liberal-leaning topics. When there is limited or no metadata matching a particular topic, it is easy to coordinate around keywords to guarantee the kind of information Google will return. This is how conspiracy theorists were able to capitalize on the phrase crisis actor, by producing a plethora of insidious content and maximizing search engine optimization, they filled the data void with their own ideas. Conservative content creators also latch on to data voids in order to optimize their positions. For example, when you search the name Nellie Orr, the only links returned are from conservative-leaning sources. Nellie Orr on YouTube produces nothing but conservative news content and conspiratorial videos. As you can see, depending on what you search, conservatism thrives online. The greater problem here is that we live in parallel internets based on our distinct worldviews. We think of Google as a window into the wider world, but it's more like a mirror, reflecting our own interests and biases back to us. To be sure, we must take seriously the fact that YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter play an increasingly important role in how our society gains access to news and information. Unfortunately, the opaqueness of their operational tactics allow unsubstantiated conspiracies to hold weight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Tripodi. Uh, Congresswoman Musgrave. Good afternoon, Chairman Cruz and Ranking Member Hirono. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify on this vitally important matter. Susan B. Anthony List is a nationwide network of more than 700,000 Americans. Our mission is to end abortion by electing national leaders and advocating for laws that save lives. We invest heavily in voter education to ensure that pro-life Americans know where their lawmakers stand on protecting the unborn. We engage in issue advocacy, advancing pro-life laws through direct lobbying and grassroots campaigns. Social media communications are essential to advancing that mission. More than two billion people worldwide and nearly 80% of the United States population use social media. If we do not have a strong presence online and the ability to reach our target audience, we might as well be invisible. Susan B. Anthony List has been fighting censorship of our content for more than two years. On March 8, 2017, SBA List promoted four tweets from our president, Mar Marjorie Dannenfelser. One was immediately rejected with Twitter citing violation of their health and pharma pharmaceutical products and services policy. And already, Mr. Chairman, you have put up that tweet by Mother Teresa. Two more tweets were rejected that very same day. On April 12, 2017, SBA List started a Twitter ad campaign urging constituents to ask legislators to pass a health care bill that stopped taxpayer funding of Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion business, which aborts more than 30, 332,000 unborn children and receives more than half a billion dollars in taxpayer funding every year. Hours later, Twitter informed us that our account was ineligible to participate in Twitter ads, citing the same policy. No explanation of exact, exactly how SBA, SBA list violated the policy was provided even after we inquired. During this same period of time, Planned Parenthood was permitted to run ads very similar to ours. In September 2017, Twitter blocked an SBA list video ad advocating John Adams for Attorney General of Virginia, stating that it was unacceptable to use the phrase killing babies in an ad. Our experience on Facebook has been very similar. Between October 9th and November 1st, 2018, 
Facebook banned seven of our paid ads supporting candidates. Brief images of premature babies born at 20 to 24 weeks when unborn children can be legally aborted were deemed sensational or graphic content. These ads have also been referred to, I believe, by Senator Lee earlier. They were the Charlotte and Micah ads. Images of little miracle babies fighting for their lives. SBA List appealed and Facebook apologized, saying the ad should have never been disapproved. But less than two hours later, another one of our ads were blocked. It would be blocked in one state, we try to run the ad in another state, and it would be blocked. Perhaps most absurd of all, Facebook and Google blocked our research and educational arm, Charlotte Lozer Institute's video ads featuring patients who were helped by ethical adult stem cell treatment. Google claimed we were trying to sell pharmaceuticals. Many pro-life groups have had their content arbitrarily blocked. YouTube removed an undercover video by the Center for Medical Progress. Twitter, to this day, refuses to allow ads from live action, citing a policy against inflammatory or provocative content, and expects them to scrub content from their own website. But Planned Parenthood has recently spent more than $100,000 in Twitter ads. Twitter blocked a campaign ad from a uh, representative at the time, Marsha Blackburn, <laughs> discussing her efforts to stop the sale of baby body parts by Planned Parenthood, and they reversed themselves after a firestorm of criticism. And you've heard that from members of the committee and Senator Blackburn herself. The Twitter account for the movie Unplanned was suspended on opening weekend, allegedly for being linked to another account that had violated Twitter's rules, then restored. Once or twice could arguably be written off as a mistake, but as our experience shows, and as one writer for the Wall Street Journal pointed out, it's a mistake that keeps on happening over and over, and it demonstrates a pattern of censorship toward the pro-life view specifically. Big social media companies wield enormous power to control speech and choose which viewpoints will be favored or disfavored. Facebook's chief operating officer, Sheryl Sandberg, stated in an interview that, quote, when you cut off speech for one person, you cut off speech for other people, end quote. We are asking for them to live up to their own professional standards and end the discrimination. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your efforts to hold them accountable. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and people of the committee for allowing me to be here and speak today. My name is Robbie Parker. I'm the father of Emily Parker, one of 20 students tragically murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School on December 14, 2012. For the last six years, I have worked very hard to process the complex emotions that have occupied my heart, mind, and soul from the events of that day. To give her a hug and a kiss before leaving to work, not knowing that would be the last time I would feel her embrace and hear her voice. Emily has two younger sisters who were only four and three years old when she was killed. My wife and I have labored diligently to support them as best as we can. For those of you who have not had to explain a loss as sudden and as tragic and as brutal as ours to your small and innocent children, let me leave you with no doubt it is an excruciating, long, and arduous process that will continue for the rest of our lives. If we had simply lost our daughter due to a disease, or a tragic accident, that painful process would perhaps have looked very similar. I still would have an experience of her being there in one moment and gone in the next. Her sisters would still have to learn to cope with the loss of a beloved sister. My wife and I would still work just as meticulously to help support them on their journey, as well as learn how to grieve as individuals, as a couple, and as a family, along with every other unforeseeable hardship that accompanies the dismal abyss of grief. However, our story is not that simple. Instead of simply being left to grieve in our own home, we were exposed to even more sinister people and motives. Within 48 hours of my daughter's murder, hoaxers and conspiracy theorists began spewing lies and hurling threats at me and my family on sites like YouTube, Facebook, and other platforms. 
I began to receive messages, emails, letters to my home, and phone calls at my work. In short, these communications told me that I was a liar, that justice was coming, that I was going to burn in hell, and to watch my back at all times. They claimed that Emily was still alive or that she never existed, all while accusing me of being a willing accomplice and conspiring with the government to stage or fake this tragedy. These people were fueled to act in this way from the information they were consuming on the internet, mainly from content found on social media platforms. Some people even created fake profiles of the shooter with his name and picture and sent me friend requests, posing as the shooter himself. I have accepted the fact that I will never know what motivated that individual to enter Sandy Hook that day. It takes a certain type of person to walk into a school and carry out what he carried out on those teachers and children. However, it takes a very different kind of person to witness that event than regurgitate demonstrably and undeniably false information about that event while simultaneously attacking victims' families for profit. I understand that motivation, and I cannot accept it. We reached out to places like YouTube and Facebook, pleading for help and asking that this content be removed from their sites. We either received program responses or cold silence. Eventually, we had FBI agents in our home to discuss some of the more credible threats lobbed at me, as well as at my wife and children. We've had to consult security experts to help us navigate certain threats and how we should respond appropriately. Ironically, we found that if a post or video displayed a picture, YouTube and Facebook would swiftly remove that content for being protected by copyright. However, they were very careful not to infringe on people's freedom of speech. However, in doing so, they systematically failed to protect us from harassment and threats and allowed their sites to be used as a genesis and breeding ground for fraudulent and hateful information to be spread, collected, and launched not just at my family, but for the whole world to consume. Recently, many of these companies have changed course and began to remove some of this content. I don't believe this was done because of the years of requests by not just Sandy Hook families, but many other victims of mass tragedies. Instead, they did so because it became more generally known that such abuse was happening and people were shocked and horrified. Only when it became clear to the general public that social media companies' inactivity and failure to protect families was a result of complacency, were they then forced to act. In other words, only when they realized it would tarnish their brand and affect them financially did they finally respond appropriately. I hate to think how much time has been stolen from us because of this issue. Instead of grieving, my family was forced to use what precious energy we had to combat these attacks alone, to protect Emily's memory, ourselves, instead of focusing on our healing. This ordeal has taught me that time with my family is a precious and limited gift. And I wonder in what ways I've let my family down by not being able to give them 100% of my time and energy to support them the way that I knew I needed to support them. We live in a beautiful country at a beautiful time when we can share our opinions, not just with the people at our dinner table that we know agree with us, but to the whole world. That I can sit on a panel of people who they don't know if I agree or disagree with them, but we can have this conversation. Deciding what content is allowed or prohibited on these platforms is paramount in the continuation of our rights to expression. Allowing hateful, false information to proliferate on the internet doesn't just corrupt our national dialogue, it has real consequences for real people. I believe that social media companies have a duty to moderate content, not to limit, but rather to protect the First Amendment in the way in which it was intended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker, for that powerful testimony, and, and, and thank you for your courage to tell your, your horrific story. Professor Kontorovich. Chairman Cruz, Ranking Member Hirona, uh, honorable members of the committee, thank you for having me here to testify on the constitutional issues relating to the alleged ideological censorship of online content by large internet platforms. I should begin by stating that the extent to which internet platforms engage 
in politically biased content sorting, the uh, subject of the prior panel, is a factual question on which I can claim no expertise. I will assume uh, for the purpose of the present analysis that such an issue exists to some extent and consider what approaches Congress might take in responding to it. So the first thing to note is that this is not a subject, this is not a First Amendment issue. The First Amendment, of course, applies only to censorship by the government. Indeed, the text of the government speaks only of the federal government. The conduct of private actors is entirely outside the scope of the First Amendment. If anything, ideological content restrictions are editorial decisions that would be protected by the First Amendment. Nor can one say that the alleged actions of these companies implicate First Amendment values because uh, analogous to the ones that the First Amendment seeks to protect against. The First Amendment, like the Due Process Clause of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, does not have a penumbra of values beyond, which, uh, beyond its text that it protects. Thus, the values of the First Amendment are nothing more than the prohibition of governmental restraints on speech. And this point is often ob obfuscated in a variety of related contexts. For example, some supporters of net neutrality have recently and incorrectly claimed that net neutrality is in, uh, necessary to protect First Amendment values. Okay, but the mere fact that ideologically uh, biased content moderation by tech companies does not raise free speech issues does not mean that it is not a legitimate matter for public concern and concern by this body and discussion and inquiry by this body. It's certainly reasonable for Congress to take ideologically uh, biased practices by purportedly neutral internet firms into account when considering updating or revising existing legislation. Current regulation is already, as has been mentioned, not neutral on the subject of internet provider, content providers. The Communications Decency Act of 1996 provides special protections for, quote, internet computer, interactive computer services. Such companies uh, under the law cannot be treated as publishers of content on their sites created by third parties, even if they would otherwise qualify as publishers under common law. This provision shields the companies from liability from much of the content on their sites on the theory that they are not acting analogously to newspaper editors, that is to say, deciding what to include, what not to include, uh, but rather simply providing a forum or a platform. Now, this blanket presumption this statutory immunity is certainly not constitutionally mandated. And it is certainly open to revision in a different environment more than two decades after its passage. In enacting the immunity provisions, Congress explicitly assumed that, uh, that protected internet services provide, quote, a forum for a true diversity of political discourse. To the extent, and that is of course a factual question, that assumption is weakened by uh, content monitoring and modulation practices, uh, the assumptions behind two, uh, Section 230 may need to be revisited. That is to say, to the extent that these platforms are substantively uh, monitoring uh, speech, they do become more like publishers. Uh, and then a statutory exemption from treating them like publishers should be re-examined. Now, what, that re what the result of that re-examination re is is an open question. Uh, it could mean nothing. For example, limiting, their, uh, limiting the immunity under Section 230 would probably result in more filtering and censorship by these companies rather than less. Uh, at the same time, uh, it could be uh, another possible outcome would be to broaden this immunity to treat them uh, equivalent to actual publishers. Why should newspaper publishers not get the same uh, benefit? Uh, a much simpler approach to this solution, which I think avoids lots of, uh, to this problem, which avoids lots of the uh, pitfalls that we have discussed, is transparency. Uh, and having listened uh, to the hearing uh, so far, we've heard that both sides, that is to say, uh, people of all political affiliations, are concerned by content practices uh, and mon uh, modulation or lack thereof by these companies. It's, the disagreement is, in which direction does it cut? So one of the greatest strengths and attractions of platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Google is the expectation of users that through the window of their computer, they can see or access the vast parade of information out in the world. Users understand the experience of following people as their selection from amongst the myriad accounts and profiles on the platform, what they will follow. Their feed gives them a perspective on outside events. What they may not anticipate 
is that the online marketplace of ideas that they think they have access to has already been pre-sifted on certain substantive grounds in a way that is not neutral. Users that turn to a search engine to discover things about the external world will have a poor understanding of how this search may have been pre-filtered or pre-screened. Because these processes are obscure, and yet uh, consumers make assumptions about them, it would be well within the scope of normal principles of transparency and consumer regulation and cons consumer disclosure to require companies to make clearer, and again, I think we've been in this hearing for several hours, and uh, it's still unclear to us, uh, for companies to make clearer to consumers what exactly these criteria are. Now, drafting serious disclosure rules is, of course, going to be difficult because it's one, it's one thing to say we uh, modulate, uh, we monitor uh, hateful content. Of course, that could mean a wide variety of things, and specifying uh, how that is applied is going to be very difficult, and the devil is in the details. But certainly applying normal consumer protection and transparency principles to this context is entirely consistent with the First Amendment. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Consman, let's, let's start with you. What we have heard uh, asserted in this meeting, uh, that, that there is no pattern of discrimination and censorship against conservative views or against pro-life views. Uh, that assertion seems manifestly contrary to all the available evidence, although I would note that, that the social media companies keep much of the evidence in a black box where we're forced to argue uh, by example rather than what would be preferable arguing based on the actual data. But, but let's focus on your example because that is one specific and immediate example. Uh, the movie Unplanned tells the true story of Abby Johnson. Abby Johnson was the clinic director of the Waco Planned Parenthood Clinic. Uh, she was not just briefly a Planned Parenthood employee. She spent, as I understand it, seven years working for Planned Parenthood. She was named Employee of the Year by Planned Parenthood. But then, horrified by the practices she saw at Planned Parenthood, by what she saw happen, she left the abortion industry and has become an outspoken pro-life advocate. Um, I will say when I attended a screening and watched the movie, it was one of the most powerful and moving movies I have ever seen. I thought I was prepared to see the movie and I was not. Um, as I understand it, virtually every TV network refused to carry trailers for the movie. Google repeatedly blocked you from advertising the movie. Twitter took your page down, an undisputed fact for which Twitter apologized here today. And not only that, but both Abby Johnson and Ashley Brasher, the actress who plays Abby Johnson in the movie, were prevented from following the Twitter page uh, for the movie. Is, is, is all of that correct? Am I understanding the facts correctly? <clears throat> yes, with some, only some the most minor corrections. She was actually the uh, clinic director of Bryan, Texas. Okay. It was eight years uh, for her whole uh, stint there, from volunteer to uh, clinic director. And uh, I think that's about the only uh, amendments I would, I would make to the, what you just said. And, and what were the consequences in particular of Google preventing you from advertising. As you noted, Google itself touts that its advertisements are very effective. What consequences did you face from that, that, that censorship? Well, given that there's blanket and kind of systematic censorship, social media was where we turned to. We assumed that we would be allowed to engage in a commercial transaction. Having the money to buy advertising, we assumed we'd be able to buy advertising. And even though certain uh, news organizations have treated uh, us with tremendous journalistic respect, there's a, there's a, a psychological mechanism in the, in the mind of a movie ticket buyer until they see some paid advertising, they don't really associate that, it's a, that it is a real movie and that it's coming out at a particular date. And you need to try to create somewhere between, estimates go between eight and 12 impressions. So we were not able to create those impressions very easily for that market. And, and as I understand it, despite this almost total social media blackout, although you did give credit to Facebook for not engaging in this practice, and despite this almost total media blackout, uh, the film nonetheless in its opening weekend became the number five uh, selling movie in the country despite concerted efforts to prevent moviegoers from hearing of it. It was actually number four, and when the numbers fin got finalized, we thought it was five, it actually jumped to number four when the numbers were finalized. And just so I can give a relative measure of what I believe the importance of the film is, 
Uh, before it aired, uh, Michael Ferris, who's the president of the Alliance Defending Freedom, had said, I believe this is the cultural event that can overturn Roe. Now, that would thrill some and scare others. But I will say that after about 10 days in release, or a couple more now, um, we have had approaches through Abby Johnson's organization, and then there were none, we have, which transitions workers out of the abortion industry. I believe we have something approaching 1% of the abortion workers in the United States seeking help to leave the industry. Now that's based partly on a hard number and partly on an estimate. The number of actual workers who have reached out is 94. I believe there's something on the order of about 700 clinics nationwide, if they all did, had 12 employees. Um, I wasn't a math major, but I think we still get to about one, a little better than 1%. So I think on the order of 1% of the abortion workers in the United States, after getting one look at them being portrayed on film, and, and it serves, I think, also some evidence that, that they're not being portrayed as monsters, have decided to change their lives and their profession and what they do for a living. That, that is truly extraordinary, and let me commend you. One of the things that I liked best about the film is that it was not a cartoonish portrayal, that, 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 that it was compassionate. It was compassionate to workers like Abby who were working for Planned Parenthood, although it, it displayed the, the practices of Planned Parenthood that pressure uh, women into having abortions and uh, uh, sometimes ag against what, what they would otherwise wish for. That was our attempt. Abby was very firm that she wanted this film to be a, a love letter to those who are still trapped in the industry. Uh, Congresswoman Musgrave, um, Susan B. Anthony List, let, the, what happened unplanned is not isolated. Uh, as I understand your testimony, uh, Susan B. Anthony List has faced repeated censorship over and over and over again for positive, life-affirming, pro-life messages, such as the message from Mother Teresa. And so this is not a one-time accident. This is, in fact, a consistent pattern. Is that, is that correct? It is a consistent pattern. And interestingly enough, you know, we alluded to Mother Teresa's quote. Uh, on, in other instances, we've received an apology and then try to run the same ad in another state, and it's taken down. And the fact of the matter is we have target audiences and even a couple of hours can make a dramatic impact on our ability to reach them. We have had ads that have been down for days. Uh, the longest an ad has been down is six weeks. But you can imagine uh, in the heat of a campaign trying to support an issue, how much time that it, it, it takes away from our staff's ability to do other work. Uh, it, it is blatantly unfair when similar ads, for instance, from Planned Parenthood, who receives a half a billion dollars of taxpayer funding a year, has their ads going at the same time our ads are taken down. And, and Congresswoman Musgrave, are you aware of a comparable number of instances, or even a single instance, of either Planned Parenthood being censored or blocked by Twitter or Facebook or Google? Or for that matter, let's take uh, Virginia Democratic Governor Ralph Northam, who, who, who rather horrifically advocated not only late-term abortions, but abortion after birth, truly a, a, a horrifying practice, regardless of where one falls on the spectrum of the, the debate on, on abortion. Are you aware of either of them ever having uh, a social media post blocked? I am not. And uh, it, it seems rather obvious when we talk about those two instances that the pro-life community has suffered under this censorship. Final question is for Professor Kontorovich. Um, you talked about, about Section 230. Um, and, and indeed, uh, your, your, your testimony uh, says that, that, that Section 230 is predicated on the idea that Internet companies would provide, quote, a forum for a true diversity of political discourse. Um, Number one, that language is from the statute. Number two, Congress could change and repeal that special immunity from liability that no other non-tech publisher enjoys. And number three, if Congress did repeal Section 230 immunity, Mr. Parker and others facing the horrific slander and libel he faced would have had an immediate remedy to force them to take that slanderous and libelous conduct, con content down immediately. Is all of that correct, Professor Kintorovich? Uh Yeah, that's, all, that's entirely correct. Uh, the 
pr uh, the presumption, I would call it a presumption rather than a predicate, the obvious statutory presumption, the finding of Congress, was that the uh, immunity is based on the neutrality of the platform. Uh, but I must add that the purpose of the immunity was to encourage companies to filter and moderate content. Uh, it was so that they would not be sued for doing so. So the elimination of that immunity is likely to result in more filtering, but it could be more ideologically balanced filtering. And whether one wants more net filtering that is overall more neutral, uh, rather than uh, less filtering but more lopsided, is of course a policy choice for Congress. Thank you. Senator Hirono. Thank you. Mr. Parker, um, I, oh, I'm sorry. Senator Bullenthal, I'll, uh, I, I, uh, I appreciate Senator Hirono uh, because I have a meeting back in the office and uh, I will be very brief. I just want to ask uh, Mr. Parker a couple of questions, if I may, sir. First, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your courage and strength. Uh, you reflect the incredible bravery of the Sandy Hook families. And um, although you're no longer a resident of Connecticut, you represent them and many, many others by being here today and working through the grief and pain that still haunts you and that was aggravated needlessly and cruelly by those harassers who, as I understand it, denied that the Sandy Hook tragedy even occurred. Is that right? Correct. And the harassment included threats to yourself and your family. You have two young daughters, and that created a lot of fear and disruption in your life, did it not? Yeah, it did, of course. And this wasn't just stuff that people were hiding behind computer screens. The majority of it was, but I've had experiences where people have come up to me on the street and and um, accosted me and called me out and, and yelled profanities. And in one instance, I had just barely walked away from my family. Um, I had dropped them off at some place and I went and parked the car and I was walking back. So my children were just, I mean, minutes away from experiencing that same, that same experience with me. And so the, the impact was not just those harassers, and I'm not going to use specific names sure. here, but it had a ripple effect. There were ramifications in real time and real life of what was happening on the internet. Exactly, and what was frustrating, like I, like I tried to say, it was, you know, when we, we felt like by going and, and asking that this content be removed and, and we felt like, you know, because there were, there were legitimate threats and there was real fear there and um, how, there's no way that I'm gonna be able to quantify those effects in the way in how, I'm gonna have to wait and see how my children live the rest of their lives before I can see how well we did at helping them process their grief and how much distraction this was for us in, in our ability to do that properly. And so I know the effects that it's had on me and in what I need to do to heal. And I'm an adult and I can process those things and knowing how much energy that is for me and what, there isn't a child version of grief. They feel the same things and to the same weight that I do, and so knowing what I felt, I can imagine what my children are feeling, and knowing that there were times when I wasn't available to them like I should have been because I was dealing with these things, um, there's not a price to put on that effect. The fact that Facebook failed or refused to take action itself aggravated that pain, did it not? Well, absolutely, I mean, because Facebook, the it, it likes to share things, and so you start sharing things, and it gets proliferated around and around and around. And um, uh, one thing that I took out of my testimony that I wasn't able to, I, just for context of time, but um, I had some really good friends that, that they set up a memorial page for my daughter, and it was a place where people could go and express their condolences and, and their love and support. And we ended up having to take that page down because of all the inundation of vile videos and comments and attacks at, that wasn't just at me, but it was at other people and friends of mine that were receiving phone calls at their houses because of their support for us. In effect, this harassment permitted by Facebook censored you. Exactly, they, when, 
uh, like I said in my testimony, when we, when we try to get them to, to respond in any form, um, their, uh, their response was that um, they, they couldn't, at that time, felt like they couldn't moderate uh, what people were saying and expressing their opinions. The pain and anxiety experienced by you was shared by other families as well, was it not? Yeah, it's, it's, when we get together, it's definitely something that we talk about. And do you know whether victims and survivors of similar kinds of tragedies have seen the same in their own lives? Yeah, so my approach was, I was taught, you know, how to deal with bullies was to ignore them and they will go away. And that's what I was teaching my children and not exposing them to this. But as time went on and they weren't going away and it kept being proliferated, I finally realized that my children are going to get old enough that they're going to run into this. And what am I going to do to protect them? They see how hard I work to protect Emily's memory. What are my living children going to wonder about what I'm doing to protect them? I had a conversation with a family from Parkland whose daughter was murdered. They share the same faith as ours. And, and we were talking, and, and one of the comments that the, the wife made was, I don't, um, she was commenting about videos about her husband because he had made some public comments. And she goes, I don't know if you guys ever experienced anything like this. And we just kind of had that black humor laugh, like, no, of course we've experienced this. And that was when I realized that I needed to take a more proactive approach in this and proactively try and protect not just my family, but future victims because there are so many. And, and unfortunately, we know that there will be others. And I have the energy now to be able to fight that fight when I know that they don't. And so I stepped in for them. Thank you for being here. You and I have never discussed this issue before, have we? No. But I'm deeply grateful to you for being here today. And I think countless others are as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank you, Parker. Senator. Thank you. Senator Hirano. Thank you. Before I begin my questions, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter a number of items into the record. Uh, the statement of Andy Parker, whose daughter Allison Parker was shot and murdered while reporting on live TV in August 2015. Like our witness Robbie Parker, Andy Parker and his family have been the targets of online conspiracy theories, harassment, and threats. The statement of Corinne McSherry of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the statement of Baron Souza. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, of Tech Freedom. I'd also like to enter into the record with the unanimous uh, consent, entering Dr. Chipotle's articles relating to well, a report titled Searching for Alternative Facts, Analyzing script Scriptural Inter Inference in Conservative News Practices, and another of her articles entitled No, Big Tech Isn't Silencing Conservatism. Without objection, all of the referenced uh, materials will be entered in the Thank record. Thank you. Mr. Parker, I, I too uh, extend to you our, my and our deepest condolences for the tragic loss of your daughter, and I thank you for your courage and that of your entire family. So I, I'm wondering whether uh, the tech companies that you contacted ever apologized to you for the, the kind of, uh, of posts that uh, uh, were so hurtful and damaging to your family? Um, this afternoon, after the first panel was, was done, um, uh, the representative from Twitter and, and Facebook uh, approached me and, and talked to me and expressed their condolences and, and apologies. Obviously, Google, which is not here, they still have posts, as I showed in my chart, that they still have posts that has conspiracy theories and attacking you for basically uh, lying. So there's work to be done with those folks. I have some questions for Dr. Tripodi. You know, President Trump this past summer tweeted that Google rigs its search results in favor of supposedly liberal news outlets. Based on your research, does Google rig its search results against conservatives? Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Based on my research and what I was arguing in my testimony, the results that we receive from Google are more based on what we put into Google than what we get out of it. I think that's a really, really important uh, point to make because depending on what kind of words you put in, out will pop different kinds of sites and um, links. Exactly. And, and so if you put in certain things, I mean, a lot of conservative, what might be deemed conservative sites and links will pop up. And if you put something else in, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get some other kinds of results. So I think um, 
That is a very important point that you made. Thank you very much. Um, we have heard various anecdotal evidence of bias. Uh, <laughs> there are other examples like uh, Chick-fil-A Appreciation, Appreciation Day page that uh, um, where that was removed from Facebook for approximately 24 hours in 2012, and certain videos produced by PragerU that have either been taken down or demonetized. What leads to a page being taken down on Facebook or a video being demonetized on YouTube? Do you know, Dr. Chipotle? And do examples like these demonstrate bias on the part of tech and social media companies? Thank you so much for this question. I think this is actually a very important point for this hearing. We've been using conversations about censorship and bias to describe actually five to six different things and as far as what I've been listening to in terms of testimony. So we've been thinking about advertising, we've been thinking about content moderation, we've been thinking about deplatforming, we've been thinking about restrictions that different sites might put on their videos as to age restrictions, and we've been also talking about demonetization. And I think being very clear about what you're discussing is of utmost importance. So in response to some of the conversations that you've been talking about, and, and I believe this, uh, uh, this is really what's happening um, with regard to a lot of the testimony today, issues of content moderation are very murky, and I think we could bipartisanly agree that there needs to be more transparency mm -hmm. regarding how content gets flagged. Mm -hmm. But I think it is also really important to understand, based on the conversations that I've been listening to, that content moderation is a kind of a many-step process, and that it's quite possible that a lot of the content that's being initially removed from these platforms was not because of any kind of executive, but was because of users tagging that content as inappropriate. And that would be a user sensor issue, not a platform sensor issue. And a lot of the content moderation decisions are often made in non-US countries by people who make very low wages and have about three to five seconds to determine yes. if content should go up or not. So I think uh, understanding how the content moderation process works is very important and needs more transparency. Oh, in your testimony, you also discuss the ways that organizations and, and individuals use certain tactics to game the algorithms behind Facebook's and Twitter's feeds. Are these tactics only av available to liberals or do conservatives also use these tactics? Well, as my testimony makes clear, these are tactics that I've observed by studying conservative media, but absolutely. I, I would say that search engine optimization is not partisan and is something that all corporations and politicians mm -hmm. are using. I have a question for uh, Professor Kontrovich. You said that, um, well, if we were to take away the immunity that I think it would lead to more content being uh, uh, deleted or, or whatever the term is. So uh, you did say that perhaps the content could be more ideologically neutral. Do you have uh, evidence? Are you citing to something for the proposition that uh, the, these platforms are not ideologically neutral? Uh, as I said in my comments, uh, I am taking as a, uh, an assumption for purposes of legal anal analysis that this problem exists. Uh, the existence of the problem is an empirical question, not a legal question. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, the point is that the publisher protection, treating the, treating, two thirds treating uh, the companies as not being publishers, is to make them uh, not liable for any kind of content. And uh, presumably that the lifting of such a limitation would result in a general barrage of litigation which would dwarf any kind of ideological effect. I would say so, but uh, well, assuming that uh, there is not neutral um, content, uh, how would we ensure ideological neutrality on these platforms? Uh, I have not suggested that Congress must or should uh, enforce ideological neutrality. Uh, actually enforcing ideological neutrality would itself raise First Amendment questions. Uh, what I have suggested is that Congress is not obligated to provide special exemptions uh, for these companies, as 230 currently does, and certainly uh, to the extent that there, uh, to the extent that these uh, companies have substantive content uh, modulation practices, 
disclosing those in a way that consumers of the platform from whom they generate their revenue can understand what they're seeing and understand whether, you know, if they search for something and it doesn't exist, does it, is it because it doesn't exist or because it has been screened based on content and we're never going to agree what's neutral, but that could be up to consumers to judge and agree. So in your view, more uh, transparency would be uh, the way to go? Uh, it would be a way that could, uh, so the marketplace, I, I believe the marketplace of ideas is extremely robust. Uh, in my view, even if conservatives are being discriminated against by these sites, you know, they can go and start their own platforms, crazy as that may seem. Uh, that's the whole point of free speech, but you have to know what's going on to be able to take that action. Right. So more transparency uh, would be helpful in that way and not constitutionally problematic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Let me thank each of the witnesses for being here for your testimony. Uh, as with the previous panel, uh, the record uh, in this hearing will be kept open for two weeks, two weeks from today. Uh, senators are asked to submit any written questions to any of the witnesses uh, by that date, and then each of the witnesses are asked to respond to those questions uh, as, as promptly as possible. 